Actually, I think I forgot to do one thing. Yeah. No rush on my part. Are they strict about parking? Should I like? It's just interest. I mean, if we call it saying the parking lot parking. Parking. This where you work at it as well? No. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have no discipline for that. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with four and none of your people. Our guest today is Marsha Mavocal. Marsha, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So um, first, I want to start off, you know, from, for you, a blast from the past, right? So this picture here, you said it was taken back in 2011. And you know, where is this at? Yeah, this is, I think it's about 2010 or 11, might have been 2010. Uh, it's in Costa Rica. Okay. And So I had no clue that it had volcanoes in Costa Rica. Yeah. It, I mean, such beautiful, natural sort of areas. And, and I was lucky enough to spend about three or four months there. This was just after or shortly after I graduated from law school in 2000. I graduated in 2009. So this and was it like was, a kind of reward for yourself? Like, like a graduation present to yourself? Uh, no, I mean, it was, there was a lot of fun. And I definitely got to see a lot of the beaches and spent every weekend traveling around. But actually, uh, in about, I think this was February 2010, um, I accepted a visiting professional position at the UNHCR in San Jose. And so I actually went down there to work. It was a, you know, a volunteer position, but... Uh, I spent about three months working there and living in San Jose. And, you know, every weekend we would go do things like, you know, go to the cloud rainforest and visit volcanoes, spend some time on the beaches and uh, go dancing in San Jose. <laughs> and it was it was fun. It was a really interesting time. Uh, 2009 was the recession, yeah. right? So it was one of the many recessions we've had. Yeah, a, a very memorable one for me because, you know, here I am graduating from law school. Like perfect timing, right? Yeah, like, yay, ready to enter the, the job market and it's the worst time possible. Um, a lot of my a lot of my colleagues that graduated, you know, they had position, you know, offers. And as soon as they, you know, got close to graduation, firms were saying, well, you know, actually, maybe you should take a year and then and, and yeah. come back to it. Yeah. Go we'll backpack how... for a year. Go to scare right. yourself. Yeah. yeah, I mean, some lucky few, lucky people were able to get sort of a portion of their, especially if they had positions at large national mm -hmm. firms. They would say, "Hey, here's a, a half year salary, which is still pretty good when yeah. you're going yeah. to a big firm. Um, go work anywhere in the world for a nonprofit, and you know, we'll we'll talk in a year." And so, I had this kind of really interesting, unique experience where I moved to San Jose, and it was it was a number of legal professionals, a lot of us new lawyers. Um, San Jose is the home of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, there's some nonprofits there that do legal advocacy work before the court. And um, there's the UNHCR as well in, in San Jose. So I I lived in a with one of my best friends from law school who was working at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights as an intern. Uh, we also sh had a roommate who worked at a nonprofit that, you know, advocated and, and brought cases before the court. 
And uh, and then I was at the UNHCR. And so there was this really interesting group of professionals doing that type of work at that time. And we all sort of lived there, worked there for a time period. And, um, you know, and then eventually went back to wherever we were from. And so we, I had colleagues and friends from kind of around the world. And uh, it was interesting. It was, you know, better than trying to job hunt at home. But I still got a really good experience. Uh, during my time at the UNHCR, I was working on like a practitioner's manual for refugee protection um, within the inter-American court system, some policy kind of guidances, and um, some of the resolutions that the UNHCR were, was working on to bring before the court. And so I was, it was a very short stint, of course, I was incredibly lucky to uh, have made that connection. It was actually through my law school, my, uh, I had done the clinic for human rights at Seattle University. And I was one of two students that was uh, able to travel to Costa Rica. This was right after graduation, but before I took the bar exam, like, which is if you're if you're a lawyer, it's like the, one of the most stressful times in your life because you're just studying for the bar and you're, you know, every waking, breathing moment of your life, you're just running these exam problems in your mind. And but um, we were selected to. Uh, go do a special uh, oral argument before the Court of Human Rights with our professor. Uh, I think he's still the the clinic director there, uh, Professor Ankoviak. And we went and did a special advisory hearing, did an oral, oral argument. I mean, here I am, a brand new, not even really a lawyer because I hadn't passed the bar exam yet and was able to go travel. And so through that sort of experience and that connection, I my professor also introduced me afterwards to the UNHCR and said, hey, she's you know, got some time. <laughs> do you do you need some, uh, you know, sort of a, was a visiting professional was sort of the position title. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think that, I mean, you're really good at this networking, meeting people, knowing people opens up all these really interesting doors and opportunities that you wouldn't meet otherwise. So at this time, is it safe to assume that everyone there was like kind of idealistic in the mindset? And what, how was that? How that, how do y'all feel up for each other being so idealistic? I, you know, like, you know, save, go save the world. You know, we're just out of college. Like, just rule the world. Was that kind of a mindset there? And you just fit off it and like I did think, great things? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I think, yeah, sure. We were, I'm sure all pretty idealistic. I think we felt really passionate about the work we were doing. I mean, mo probably most of those people, I, I don't know, maybe most, but a lot of them were going back to, to corporate law firms, right. To like, to firms that weren't doing that type of work. Um, this was a interesting and unique opportunity for them to sort of uh, put all of that education and that time and energy and and for some people that the money they had at that point that they couldn't start working at the firm, but they were able to put that towards living and doing this type of work, sort of really social justice, human rights work. And so um, it was it was, yeah, like I said, it was a very unique uh, time in in my life, I'm sure. And there's as well. Some of us have stayed in contact and, you know, through Facebook, you kind of see what everybody is doing. We've all gone different directions, but everybody's, I mean, I think that was um, special, special period of time. And what are some other places you travel to? Generally, um, so I, my family's from India. So I've been to, you know, India a lot as a child. It's been some time now, but um, that was sort of a, you know, summer, winter break sort of trip that we would take. Uh, my family also is uh, in Germany. So we used to go to Germany a lot. Um, what part of Germany? Um, so my my family, my parents actually immigrated to Germany from India to Frankfurt okay. uh, initially. Before. So as an army, I was in Würzburg for a couple of years. I was in Wiesbaden right outside of Frankfurt for a couple of years. Yeah. yeah. My um, my parents lived there for, I think my mom lived there for 15 years, um, met my father there. So they were there separately. Um, my dad did his PhD in, in Frankfurt and uh, my mom went to nursing school and was a nurse. So they, they still, they speak German still or? Uh, they do. I mean, you know, I think it's like anything. I think learning languages is not as easy as riding a bike. Like you can't just get back yeah, on and be like, yeah. oh yeah, this is, you know, I'm picking that right yeah. back up. But, you know, if you're in the environment and you're surrounded by it, like when they go to Germany, my mom still has family there. So her... She was the first, they both were the first to leave and immigrate from India. Uh, and, and, side. And I'm guessing can your parents still cook like really good German food. They do. Yeah, they definitely, there's like, I have memories of yeah. growing up in like, you know, schnitzel and yeah. things were just sort of like a normal part of our, uh, yeah. our life, which, um, you know, I don't think I quite appreciate as appreciated then as much as I do now, you know, that it was like this really interesting combination of culture, you know, Indian yeah. origin, but also this, really big time period in Germany that shaped 
And during a really... I mean, 15 years is a long time, right? Yeah, and she was like 17 when she moved there. So it was, you know, really formative years. And uh, my dad, I think, was like maybe 20 or 21 when he moved there. And so, uh, yeah, I feel like there's sort of this interesting combination of... That is an interesting dynamic, Indian, German, like, yeah. Yeah, it's not a very common one. I mean, there was, in that time period, a a small group of them. So it, it wasn't just my parents. They had like, I mean, it's certainly more now than it was back in the 60s, but... Um, you know, as I think is pretty common in, in most immigrant communities, when you move to a new new area outside of your of your country of origin, you tend to find others yeah. that are there. Yeah. Right. And you, you yeah. make a community, make a community where yeah. you are. Yeah. And so um, in the 70s, um, a, a number of them moved to the United States. And so we, we still have friends, family friends here that my parents knew back in the days of living in Germany. They live in other parts of the U.S., but um, it's it's it was a it was a journey that they all kind of did together, and a lot of that had to do through my mom's you know being a nurse. That's how they kind of came to the United States. So, what's the next country where we go to? Like, what's the country on your bucket list you want to travel to? Um, I would love to go to New Zealand. Okay. I have a good friend that lives there. Um, I would love to. Uh, I haven't been to Greece. I've been to a, a, a fair amount of countries within Europe. Um, Eastern Europe is definitely, and, and, you know, although I've been to India, you know, South Asia, I haven't, uh, I just recently was talking to somebody I would love to do sort of like Thailand, Vietnam, yeah. that sort of thing. I was just in Vietnam for 10 days from France this September, man. It's just a great experience. Yeah. And we were stationed in Korea in the army for three years. My wife has family in Thailand, right? He was in the Air Force, got off stage. We went there a couple of weeks ago. So that's it a fun time. Yeah. So what, what's a country that you want to go to? And people are like, like, you want to go where? Like, that's kind of like off the wall. Like me, mine would be probably like Norway. I, kinda, I want to go to no, no, Norway for some reason, right? Yeah. I have no idea why. Maybe the Northern Lights or cold, I don't know. But yeah, what's a country for you? Like, people like, you want to go where? Uh, gosh, what's a country that, uh, I don't know if I have one that's totally off the wall that I want to visit. Um, I mean, I would love to, I'd love to explore the sort of, some of, the, some of the areas in Africa, but I don't I mean, I don't think that's anything off the wall. I mean, right now, traveling is not. I mean, my whole family is going to India for um, Christmas, but I have uh, three-year-old twins, and I'm, I'm not okay. quite ready to, okay, to, take, a, to yeah. take a big Basically, t- basically twins. Yeah. yeah, especially twins, and and I'm like, that's not going to be fun for us or for anybody else on the plane at this no. time. So um, we're... Unless you, unless you, like, somehow buy all the first class tickets for yourself right right yeah Yeah. no that would be ideal but (laughs) not gonna happen so yeah yeah, hopefully in another couple years we'll start to be able to take sort of shorter journeys uh you know international trips but maybe we'll start with like canada mexico (laughs) and then work our way further uh the older they get yeah you have twin boys twin girls twin girls twin girls okay yeah nice um and so you also have a reader right do you read? Like, to be. Do you like read like a book at one setting? Like do you like? Yeah. And what kind of books you read? I I do tend to if I pick up a book I do tend to kind of like dive into it. I feel like I'm definitely a binge reader. I I'm not like a let me read a chapter a day. I I don't think I have that. I mean it's I don't know if it's a lack of discipline or I just enjoy it and then I kind of fall into it. And so I think my reading. Uh, kind of interest vary. I would say I, you know, I went through a, a long period in my youth where I was really into like Brit- old British literature. I went through like the Bronte sisters, the Aust- you know, Jane Austen. I think I read Pride and Prejudice like 10 times. But um, more recently, uh, I've been more into Audible. So I've been doing a little bit more reading while driving, sort of listening to the Audibles. But um, Trevor Noah's book, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, have been a couple that um, I really enjoyed, especially the Audible audiobooks. Um, I recently read uh, Remarkably Bright Creatures, uh, and I also enjoy reading um, some books by Indian authors. Jhumpa Lahiri is one of my my favorites, namesake. Um, so those are a few. I, I mean, obviously, in the last few years with like small children, it's been a little more challenging. If I pick up a book, you know, with you combine having young kids plus the sleep deprivation. <laughs> usually ends up with me just falling asleep, but trying to sort of get back on the bandwagon now that that's not as much of an issue. Yeah. So let me ask you this, right? So there's a lot of things I recently, hopefully I asked this because Kirk So there's like people out there will say, you know, if you're a woman, you can have it all, right? You can be the great, greatest mother, the greatest employee, the greatest wife, all that stuff. Really, is that possible? I mean, is it? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. 
I mean, I think we're all just doing our best. Yeah. Um, and what having it all means is different to, to everybody. Uh, for me, I, it was important to have a, have a career. I love what I do. I enjoy my work. I enjoy my colleagues. I like being involved in the community. But um, yeah, being a mom was also always a dream. So, I mean, I feel like I'm also incredibly fortunate and, you know, have privilege that I could kind of do both of those things and that I had such a supportive community and workplace um, and husband. So he's actually been a stay-at-home dad for the last couple of years. So it's that's huge in allowing me to be able to do what what I'm doing. So is there like a big Indian American community here in the Seattle area? Um, there is. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of there's a, a pretty good concentration on the east side um, at Redmond and Kirkland. But, uh, you know, when I moved here in 2006, I wasn't I didn't see that as much. I think I was I felt like a little bit of a lack of that. I was involved in law school in we have a South, uh, South Asian uh, Law Student Association. Salsa was our, was our name. And uh, we partnered with the South Asian Bar Association for events and mentors. So through that, I started to make connections with the the community. I mean, I, I'm not from Washington, so I didn't come with like a built in knowledge of and I didn't know anybody here when I moved here. I had a, a friend from college who's not uh, Indian. But so I when I moved up here, I kind of had to figure that all out. And um, a lot of that those connections in that community was made through law school, becoming a lawyer, and then being a part of the minority bar associations. So, and then also just within my the immigration bar, uh, we have a pretty good community of Indian immigration lawyers and we all know each other, or most of us do. And what age were you when you were like, okay, I want to be a lawyer, when did it happen? Like, you know, most like most kids that grew up, they want to be like a superhero, fireman. Yeah, you don't hear a lot. Astronaut, yeah. you know. Right, uh, and no, I wasn't like five-year-olds being like, I want, you know, I want to be a lawyer, but, um. I don't think I knew what I want that I wanted to do it until after I, you know, until I was in my twenties for sure. I, I kind of had this concept of wanting to do work that helped others that improved others' lives. You know, when I went to law school, I was more, I, I had, I knew that I wanted to do something that kind of, you know, helped others. And I, I had this idea of working in like the public se sector, maybe doing nonprofit work. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do more policy side. I mean, you, go, you can go to law school and not be practicing law in the more traditional sense. You can use that to do a lot of other important work. So, um, and I think a lot of people go to law school not knowing exactly what area you're going to fall into. You know, when we interview law students, we say, you know, it, it's good to have sort of broad interests and to figure it out by going into the workplace and doing the work and seeing what triggers your interest the most. Um, but, um, you know, obviously coming from an immigrant family, there's that kind of that background of knowing that that's the path my family took to get here. And then uh, again, it's like this, the connections you make, the people that influence you. And one of my mentors um, was a immigration attorney. When I was living in Costa Rica, uh, we stayed in contact. He was running for a judicial position at the time. And he said, hey, I, I could use... Um, some help. He was a solo practitioner. And so he was an immigration lawyer. And I was like, well, yeah, that's like an area that I was interested in. I don't know in what capacity, but it it started my kind of journey when I came back from Costa Rica, um, giving me that insight into sort of this world of immigration, but like business immigration, family immigration. Because I think when a lot of people hear you're an immigration lawyer, they automatically think about like individuals in deportation, you know, all the, the images you see, the border issues, sort of the images you see on TV um, most commonly, which are true as well, but there are sort of many facets to immigration law. So what are the types of law were you, were you thinking about doing besides immigration? I'm sure, does that be like, were you thinking about doing corporate or finance or I was not criminal? thinking about doing corporate or finance or criminal. Okay. Yeah, I was definitely like, I'm gonna work at a nonprofit, I'm gonna do something so in human the, rights. I mean, obviously going to the, doing the work in Costa Rica. Um, so that was I, your mindset the whole time. Yeah. And I did an immigration clinic in law school as well, where we worked on a case for an individual who was detained at the Tacoma Detention Center. And uh, so I was like, well, maybe if I do work, I'll work, uh, you know, helping individuals who are in detention. I don't even think I understood, you know, that there were other parts to immigration law. And I, you know, they're all obviously equally important, but it's just where my path led me, which is. Uh, primarily in sort of business and family immigration. And so 
that first opportunity when I returned from Costa Rica help open this new door. I was like, wow, I didn't even realize this existed. And it's very interesting. And then um, after, after a few years there, I worked sort of in-house with the tech company doing that work and then ended up where I'm now at Ryan Swanson. Yeah. So we have, we have this presidential election come up, right? And whoever you vote for Trump or Biden, it doesn't matter to me, but does it really matter who wins the election as far as immigration law and stuff like that? Does it really make a bit of a difference? Or is all this stuff really done like at low levels below the president? Or is the presidency oh, really matter? Yeah, certainly not. The, there's a, a huge difference in, in what the outcome of the election is. And, you know, I've, I've already practiced law, immigration law during both administrations now, right? So I was obviously doing this when we had a Trump presidency and now during the Biden presidency and during the Obama presidency in the past. So, um, you can see the differences in your in your cases in your obviously in the policy set by the executive branch. Um, you know, Obama gave us DACA, gave us the deferred action for childhood arrivals. And when we went through the four years of the Trump presidency, it's it's all about sort of a shift in their priorities and their perspectives. Like is immig is the the concept of immigration welcoming about sort of, um, you know, being protective and, and understanding that these ind individuals are coming into the U.S. under different in different ways. There's we have our high skilled workers, we have refugees, we have individuals who are coming to the border seeking help and asylum. Um, and what is our administration and our country's sort of concept of that? And and are they? Is it like yes, we want to help these individuals. We want to we want there to be a level of support, or is it more protectionist? And is it more we're you know America first, right? So. Um, those concepts and that sort of outlook definitely weighs in on how our immigration system and policies and executive orders, all of these things, have, what comes down during that administration. So is there a difference between policy for like, we'll say legal immigration and a different for illegal immigration or is the immigration policy just immigration policy? Um, so immigration is federal. Um, you know, we have immigration laws, right, in place. We also have policies by the agencies. Um, and, you know, what we see when we have different administrations, I mean, the laws typically don't change very easily, right? These are set, uh, set laws and um, takes congressional acts to do that. But um, what we do see change are executive policies and the direction and the sort of the uh, kind of what the outlook of the agency. So are we saying, you know, when, when we had a Trump administration at one point, they took away even from the sort of agency motto or, or guiding principles, the idea of like customer service, essentially. Um, when we, pra when I was doing, uh, you know, during practicing law during the last administration, every Friday, we, if you were an immigration lawyer, you would be sort of holding your breath, waiting for the next email to come from CIS saying, here's the new policy we're putting into place, or here's how we're now going to interpret this a bit differently than we did. Um, or here's a new travel ban. If you remember the, this was, you know, a big deal in the, during this time, the Muslim travel ban. So there was, uh, it was a different outlook on how immigration was viewed. And, um, and, and then even just adjudic, you know, preparing and filing cases, the rates of RFEs, which are sort of pushed back by the government. And, you know, traditionally you think about it applying to really, um, people who are undocumented or so the focus being on sort of this concept of illegals, but it, it impacted everybody. I mean, uh, my business immigration clients, it was always an uphill battle to get these skilled individuals who are in high tech fields or in, you know, architects, accountants, engineers, you know, all sorts of scientists. Um, even these cases with individuals who are filing for specialty occupation positions, it was still like you were climbing up a hill to get the, to get there. Um, more pushback, more scrutiny on their cases, more denials across the board. So it was, it was just a kind of a difficult time, I'd say. Yeah. So what's your take on this, right? So, so I'm, I'm from Texas, right? It's like recently there's like this battle on the border, right? Like the state of Texas says, we're going to protect our border, keep illegals from coming over. Then the federal government says, no, that's our job. And Texas will say, no, do your job, right? And I have friends on Facebook. They're so stuff. There's no illegals here. Another friend so like all of them come across the border, like so, like how you know what's truth, right? What's really going on down there, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that in this day and age, that the concept of truth, like that, that's questioned so heavily. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, it feels like nobody believes that. I mean, there's like ten truths, and 
you yeah. know, your, your truth isn't right. My truth is right. Based on your lens and your personal, whatever it is, you know, and yeah. And you do your research on Facebook. <laughs> right. Or what news network you watch or what podcasts you listen yeah. to, right? Um, and and yeah, there is certainly this ongoing battle between certain states and the federal government and states saying, well, if you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. We're the ones that are impacted in the federal government and the Department of Justice saying, nope, that's not in your purview. And uh, you you can't be, in, you know, enacting laws or or, you know, charging people with crimes that, you know, fall into our purview of, of federal law. And yeah. so that's, I don't think that's a battle that's going to be going away anytime soon. No. Um, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any great answers there. I think that there's so many great immigration lawyers that have sort of risen to the challenge of travel to the border who have yeah. done such great advocacy work. I'm, I'm part of a, the American Immigration Lawyers Association and we are, uh, you know, the interesting thing about the other reason I really actually enjoy doing this type of law is sort of the collegiality around it. Uh, you know, we are not opposing counsel to each other, right? We are all doing sort of work for our clients and it's filings and court, whether you're in court or whether you're filing with CIS, it's, you know, the government's on the other side. It, so so you know, is the government like kind of like the prosecutor, they're trying to prove, hey, you know, this person needs to be deported and they try to prove where they have to be reported to the judge. Is that kind of like almost like a criminal case? Like um, there, so there are courts that are specific immigration courts. It's, yeah, it's different immigration cases. And I don't do immigration court work, but uh, you know, I've done some pro bono work, but um, yes, it is a separate system. Um, and filings that we do, whether it be family or business are all with USCIS. That's us citizenship and immigration services. If you are working on cases that go through the consulates, whether it be family-based cases or investor cases, um, that's through Department of State, right? So this is all Department of Homeland Security, but there's all these different agencies that adjudicate, um, you know, depending on what your case is and what the, the path is that you're doing. Yeah. So this is my take on it, right? Like, you, I think you have like one side, they'll say like, everyone come across the board illegal, they're rapists, murderers, drug lords. Other side will say like, no, everyone coming over is like the perfect person. They don't want to build opportunity. But I, I think the two somewhere in the middle, right? But how do we as a country like kind of like determine like who's like, of course you can't be God to tell, you know who's telling the truth, right? Yeah. Because a single a mother with three kids might be, you know, a drug lord's wife or something, right? You never know, right? So how how do you like we judge like who to come over, who like, I mean, I don't know how you do that, right? I just don't know how you do yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, there are, there's, we have a system. It's not a perfect system by any means. There's plenty that needs to be changed. But we do have systems in place to help those individuals that come here seeking refuge or come here and apply for asylum. And how do these people prove this, right? Is this like, do, do I say, I'm Jason, I came from Venezuela, I'm being prosecuted, and they take my water mouth after like some kind of paperwork or like? It's sometimes both. I mean, if you are Jason from Venezuela that was persecuted for your religious beliefs and you fled your home in the middle of the night, did you have time to draft up declarations from friends saying, I saw you get beaten in the street but who's because gonna, you're who's gonna know how to do that who's gonna know to do that yeah so i'm saying everybody has a different level of what they can present you know in some cases you're able to get evidence to demonstrate yep i had you know i was persecuted in my home country here's some records here's some statements from friends and family who are still there um here's evidence that i was a part of that political group or that i did practice that religion here's uh photos Okay. of you know it just it depends and varies by case but yeah so like me i, I believe everyone tells the truth right it's probably a fault of mine obviously everyone doesn't tell the truth right so when people cross the board and, and they're lying but they're good liars like i guess they kind of get through the system or like i mean um, can i say that everybody that goes through the system is telling the truth i, I can't yeah. i don't think any of us can say and that my, my thing is like i don't think you shut off immigration because a few people lie right yeah unfortunately you have to let them in right I mean, I so. you you hope that the system is working in the way it should. It's it's designed to 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 assess that, to route that out, to say, you know, here's the standards you have to meet. Here's the people who are reviewing and adjudicating adjudicating those cases who are looking for those liars, um, who are looking for people who abuse the system. But and then you have the advocates that are there to help people navigate it. It's not an easy system to navigate. Yeah. The system is definitely overtaxed right now, right? Say that again. The system is like definitely overtaxed, like overburdened with different things. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's more people that want to immigrate to the United States under all categories yeah. than there are 
spots available in any one given year. And besides like hiring more people to handle this situation, is there anything that's actually be done to fix this, you think? I mean, that's a conversation that's been happening for a long time, yeah, they, right? Yeah. So our our system, our so the the general immigration system is based on a sort of a quota base. There's family and employment base are the sort of the, the most common routes. Um, and we allocate a certain number of visas annually for those. So for like employment-based visas, we have 140,000 each year. And then for family-based, we have at least 226,000 each and, year. And how often do those numbers change, either up or down? Or that pretty much solid for that, all time? That's the allo allotment, the minimum allotment. And then it, it goes through, a, there's a preference system. There's preference categories in each one. And then every country has about 7% 7, 7 of that. Okay. But as you can imagine, the demand from certain countries exceeds the amount yeah. allotted. 140,000 is not a lot of people. It's, it's not. It. And then you have this high demand from countries like India or China, these high skilled workers. And um, it and because of the high demand and the limited visas, then you create it creates these backlogs, these long queues, where if you're an Indian citizen, let's say you're a software engineer here working at a tech company in Seattle, and you've probably got a 12 plus year wait yeah. to get to get lawful permanent residence. And what's the that. thing recently, I think I read somewhere like a lot of these tech companies are laying off these people and now they have to go back to their home country within like a short amount of time unless they find another job or something. Yeah, I mean, and it depends on what category of, of work visa they're under. But yeah, I mean, obviously we're seeing a lot right now in the news on, on companies having these mass layoffs, depending on what your visa category is that you usually have, a say for example, you're an H1B employee, you have a 60 day grace period during which you can change status, adjust status, depart the United States. It's it's not a lot of time if you think about somebody that's probably been here for, I mean, some of these individuals could have been here for over a decade. Yeah. Own a home, have mm -hmm. kids in school. Part of the community, paying taxes, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Right. And kids so, are cool, like you said. Right. And kids born here. And in 60 days, you got to go back to your home country, whether it is. Right. Where you yeah, don't know you, one. Yeah. I mean, you yeah, you might not have been there in such a long time that your community, your network has changed quite significantly. So it's uh, it's a difficult position for a lot of people to be in. So for these 140,000 slots, like, on average, I'm guess there's like ten applicants for every slot available, or is it like is it more than that? Well, if you if you're imagining just like just taking for example India, these individuals have probably a twelve year wait. So if they go through the process, they get their number. It's called a priority date, and then they think well, now I've got to wait twelve years because that's how long the line of individuals. It's you know millions yeah. of people who are waiting in line. So I'm thinking out loud here. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but like. If I'm, I'm say I, 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 I'm, I, I live in Vietnam, right? I'm trying to come here and just try your rate. And I look and I see all these people coming across the border. Why well, don't I just fucking like catch a flight to like, you know, somewhere in South America, come to the border and go like that way and, and cut the line, right? Like, I mean, why, why you, not do you that? You could do that and come here, but then how do you stay? And I, and, I mean, I, I don't think for a minute that coming in, whatever the reason is that brings you into the country without going through the system, that it's easy to live here oh, in that, in that I mean, sort of... Yeah. In, in sort of, in that sort of state of constant fear, yeah. right? Of, yeah, that's true. But if you're in a country like you're not doing good, you know, like man, I'm gonna live the American dream. I well, can I can yeah. suffer for trial years, or I can just take a risk and like, especially if you have like friends or family over anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, and that that's the thing. That's why people do it, right? It's yeah. it's not generally they're just like, yeah, why not? I should just go live in this country. Yeah, I don't see how you stop people from doing that. Be honest right. With you. I mean, you're you're not leaving in the middle of the night and bringing your kids across the border unless yeah. there's a reason behind yeah. that. There's this, this this even living here potentially in fear of being deported, not have feeling scared of even sort of being able to call the police for protection. Yeah, like you can't, you you can't, don't you can't do get that ticket, lightly. You can't do anything, right? Yeah, you don't do that lightly. You're not just saying like, well, why not try this out? You're doing that for, in most cases, for a reason. And yeah. so I don't think that that's something that if you're, you know, a, a tech worker or if you have some other means to get here and, and actually be able to establish a life even. Yeah. And, and that's not to say that waiting in that queue waiting 10, 12, years, 15 yeah. years, you're still living in this constant limbo of yeah. like, at any moment, I could have, this all could end. I would have to be uprooted. I have to figure out how to leave this country. And, you know, we we help clients when that happens, if there are no opportunities and they're getting down to the wire in that 60 days and they've been job hunting. And obviously right now the economy is not the greatest. It's a very saturated job market. Yeah. Um, so there are some things we could do to be like, okay, let's change you to a visitor status for, to give you maybe six more months to figure things out or tie up loose ends or, you know, get your family. It's not like you can just pick up and uproot in a minute. And so. So you know. how do you keep from getting personally too personally involved with your clients? Like I've had that behind. I mean, we're hoping you do. Not yeah. Get personally involved. How do you like keep that separate? You know, I don't 
I don't think you do. I mean, I think most of us and, you know, the work I do is most commonly with individuals going through, you know, who are who are in uh, employed, you know, supported by employers or going through family based process, but, you know, have a bit of security here. I can't even fathom what a lot of my colleagues do where they are, you know, solely working with individuals who are in detention or or going through the asylum process. Um, but regardless, even in my in the capacity we we're in, you know, we all have moments of laying awake at night thinking like, oh, my gosh, if this doesn't work out, like this person has to leave. They have to uproot. They have kids. They have, you know, their wife has a job. Um, I mean, these are the things that you wake up in the middle of the night thinking like, did I do that? Did that? Is there another strategy I can do here? What other options? Did I pursue that, you know, the right way? I mean, I think every prof profession has it to some degree, but when you're li when you're working in a profession where what you, the the, the work you do impacts somebody's livelihood and their family and their ability to, to live and work in the country. Um, it, there are many nights that we stay awake thinking about that. Have you ever seen, a, and don't give the name this, if, that, if this happened, but have you ever seen a lawyer like go too far? Like, you're like, John, why do you move this family meal with you, right? Like, this is this is too much right here, right? Has anyone gone that far to support people? Like, you're like, to okay. To have somebody that like move in. I, yeah. I mean, not, I've seen. I've that might seen, be a bad example. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've seen attorneys like, you know, definitely get like, like, really invested. Like, or you, you're putting your, like, self a, a professor risk by doing this. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I've personally had anybody put themselves at professional risk um, in in what they're doing, but I do think you can get really invested and, in, and you know, sometimes you're kind of keeping that line of, like, this is a client, this is all I can do for them, can be difficult. And, and emotionally, you get really involved, but um, in the victories are even better when that happens, and you're like, yes, you know, we tried really hard and this worked out. And uh, you know, if it goes the other way, it could be very devastating for all of us. But so for the back to it's, it's H one B one visa is what it's called. H one B. H one B. That that's one of the types of work visas. It's for specialty occupation. It's probably the most common one that you you'll you'll hear okay. in that. So that one has one hundred forty thousand like. Um... No, that's the, so that's talking particularly about employment based okay. green cards. The H one B system for private employers, um, there's only sixty five thousand. Okay. Uh, for individuals who have a, U a bachelor's degree or the equivalent and 20,000 reserved for individuals who have a U.S. master. So total of 85,000. Okay. And so it's like there's some random system. It's most like a lottery system, like random picks. Like the cynic in me is like, like, I don't believe that, right? Like there has to be some kind of hack. has to be some kind of, I won't say bribery, but some kind of, kind of grease in the world. Like how, how do you make people like me believe, no, it's actually a fair, equitable, like there's no like favoritism. No country has this is all. Yeah. Above um, you miss people that. So the system's changed over the years. Um, it up until 2020, it was um, it was essentially if you're an immigration lawyer that practices in this area, you know, all of March, you are, you know, sitting with your team, putting together H-1B packets, putting together petitions. We'd have like hundreds of these that we would ship out the last day of March to get to USCIS. They would have truckloads of these H-1B petitions arriving April 1st. Um, and then they would conduct the lottery there. And then basically you would know if you were selected, if you either got a notice saying you were selected or you got a rejected entire packet back to your firm. And these are like, they're actually like mailing or is it emails or combination before, of both? Yeah, before 2020, it was, you put the whole thing together. The it, You know, these are forms and evidence and filing fee checks and, uh, you put it and you hope you did it right and you didn't get anything wrong and you mail it all in and then you just kind of sit and wait and cross your fingers. And then in 2020, the government put together a pre-registration system so that you didn't have to go through that exercise. And instead, you would register your your com the company or the employer and the beneficiary. And then it's a computer generated lottery that now occurs. And usually the results are released at the end of March. Um, again, 85,000 slots. But. The demand is, I mean, I can imagine. is way higher. I mean, it's a, than that. It's, like you said, it's a lottery, like winning, yeah. like almost like the real lottery, right? I mean, it is. It's a computer generated lottery, yeah. and uh, so like in twenty last year, there were about I don't know, it was like seven hundred fifty, seven hundred eighty thousand submissions. Um, and one of the things that they changed this year because they felt like there was a, a a lot of fraud, a lot of duplications being submitted, trying to game the system. Um, so they've changed it to a beneficiary centric system instead. So if you had multiple employers submitting lottery submissions, so if you're an employer, like I have three job offers and all three of these employers are willing to put a lottery submission in, 
you would still only count as one submission. You're one person, one okay. submission that sounds based fair. on your passport. And so that, uh, you know, you would think that would have been the case from the beginning, but in, in that just changed this year. And so this year there were 442,000 unique beneficiary selections. Um, and it, it, it feels like it was a good shift. It felt like the, the selection rates raised just a tad. It's still, the, the demand far exceeds the available 85,000, of course. Yeah. But um, it, it does seem like at least a bit of a shift in the right direction. So at least a, so that one person isn't taking up five slots, essentially. Yeah, yeah that, that sounds more than fair, yeah. So let's suppose, actually I'll use myself as example, right? So I have a, a developer, she's a Chinese immigrant, right? She applied for this last year, wasn't picked up, right? And she's gonna do it again next year as, as my employee. Is there anything I can do as an as employer, like, you know, what's somebody doing now? So I come to you and say, hey, take my case on, You're like walk through the whole process for me if you can. Um, so we usually encourage employers, yeah, to, to figure out if they're going to move forward with this as early as you can. It's not a simple, I mean, you do, we do an assessment. We, you know, usually call it a visa assessment at my firm where we look at sort of the employer, the position, the beneficiary, there's a wage analysis, H1Bs are position specific, location specific. Um, and so we look at sort of all the components of it. What is their educational background? And we tell you, the employer, we say, okay, here's the challenges we could see with this. Like this position based in King County is, you know, the requirement's going to be, here are the four wage levels for it. You're, you're not paying them quite enough yet, but do you think by October 1 of next year when the H-1B kicks in that you can do that? Um, or we might say, hey, their, their uh, bachelor's degree is in a field that is un completely unrelated to the role that they're going to do. This, you know, immigration, this isn't going to fly. They're going to say, how is this related? Um, because it's not just that you have a degree, it has to actually relate to the position itself. So if you're a software engineer, you want to have like a computer science degree. You don't want to be a software engineer with an art degree, right? Uh, that's that's going to be a tough sell and likely to get pushed back. So we go through that analysis ahead of time. We we identify those challenges. We talk about ways that we can, if possible, uh, get around it. Like, did they, did they work for 15 years before that in the industry and then just like, went and got a degree in a completely unrelated field. And if so, can we do uh, an experience evaluation to say, but based on their 15 years of experience in tech, they have the equivalent to a bachelor's degree in a you know, computer related occupation or computer related field. Um, and in that case, we could maybe get an evaluation done to show that they do have a bachelor's in a field that's related. And so you want to do that ahead of time because once you're selected in the lottery, you have 90 days. Uh, the window is short to get the case prepared to get it filed. Um, and then it's usually, it's adjudicated between April 1 and June 30th. And then once approved, it starts October 1st. So that's the effective date of it for that. Because that's the, the beginning of the fiscal year. For and all this is done online. Like, do y'all go like in person to represent? No. It's all online. The registration's done online. The, the petition, although this year, this is the first year they've started to allow for online submissions for that. It's not like you go to some kind of court and say, I'm here representing Kevin no. HR and, you know, he should pick his person because of this. No, uh, it's fine. I have some of my colleagues have been practicing for far longer than I have. One of my one of my colleagues and mentors, uh, both two of them, but one of them has been um, practicing for like 50 plus years and and another one for, you know, maybe 40. And they both tell me and, and us all the time about how you used to be able to go with your H-1B petition to there used to be a INS uh, office downtown. And you could just stand in line and all the lawyers would be in line to file their packets. Um, that, that doesn't exist anymore. We, we file it, usually it goes to like a lockbox or to a service center. And then we wait and there's no personal interaction involved there. You're not calling anybody up. You're not going in person. It's, you just have to wait until yeah. they get the email. It is a, it's a faceless process, right? Like you're, it's, you're a, your client is a name and, and Everything mm -hmm. is in the pay in the paper. Well, that's probably the first way to do it. I was thinking, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it shows a better way to do it, but I don't. With the volume, I mean, it's it's the yeah. the more efficient way. Certainly. Um, is there any way you think we can fix the process, or like you think it's just the process what it is, or any? I mean, I don't. I think that there aren't enough visas for the the demand in it, eighty five thousand. That's like. Yeah, that's, it's not enough. Um, it is. You know, and, and it's eighty five thousand for the whole entire world, right? It's not like eighty five thousand for India, eighty five thousand for yeah. No, that's Mexico. that's total yeah. for each that's, year. That's, yeah, uh, and so it and is, these are actually people we want to come like 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 scientists and like highly skilled workers, right? Yeah. So these are specialty occupations, which means that the position has to require a degreed professional. It has to be a position that requires somebody with a degree in that field to do it. 
So, you know, you're talking about architects, accountants, yeah. lawyers, uh, you know, physicians, these. So, yes, these are highly skilled professionals. And, you know, now so the lottery is done now. Here we are and we're, you know, just about in June and uh, we're in the filing period, the last 30 days. Everybody's kind of waiting to see, will there be a second lottery? Cause sometimes there has been in the last few years. We've had um, between one and three lotteries uh, between, you know, March and usually November was the latest one we've seen. Um, and when that happens, then there could there could be another opportunity if you were in, it's from the original pool. You don't get to like reapply. Okay. But um, some individuals who are like, this is my last chance are just waiting and hoping for that potential second lottery. And so this 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 eighty five thousand number, right? Does like I'm making this up. Does like Department of Labor say, tell immigrants say we need eighty five thousand more people doing this, or does like where does that number come from? Like it, based it's on like set, set by con yeah, it's it's set by Congress. And in, and there have been times in the past, it was, uh, predates my time practicing as a lawyer, where it was increased temporarily. So it is possible to be done. It hasn't yeah, been I don't done. Think the economic, economic has to be something with it, right? Like we need more people doing this. So increase. Yeah, demand. we don't we have not seen that. So I think I believe the last increase was in the late 90s, early 2000s. That and then ago? and then that, in, that seems insane. And then in 2005, it went back to what we're at now. And so and that's regardless of the Republican, Democrat administration, like liberal. Conservative yeah, I mean, percent. we've had both right since that, then. That's kind of surprised me, honest with you. I thought one would have a higher number, maybe another one, a lower number. But Yeah, this one hasn't, this number hasn't changed, although, you know, certainly advocates have been calling for a change to the system. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, it's not enough. And so now, you know, you have all these really talented, intelligent individuals who are like, well, if I can't do it here, where can I go? Where can I make you know, where can I use my skills and make a life for myself and find a path to stability and making a home for myself. And we're going to lose, you know, really yeah. uh, skilled people to places like Canada, you know, I mean, and I, I can't fault them for it if they feel like this isn't a place where I can build a life and a home. So I hate to use the word term low skill because they like low skill talking about plumbers, all the trades, like they're high skilled, right? Mm -hmm. So is there, is there a lottery system like what quote unquote the low skilled people like, like, like there's 85,000 for high schools, like a lottery for like, like plumbers, traders, like carpenters is like a lottery system for them. Um, so there's, there is a quota system for, um, uh, so there's agricultural workers and then there's also like hotel workers, things like that. There's H2Bs. It's not an area that I practice in. Um, and it's interesting because you do see those caps raised more regularly than you do, than we've ever seen for the H1B. Um, and, uh, you know, those go through a similar system of having to apply. There's a set amount per year. There's a process for it. Um, and, and, you know, that H2As and H2Bs, but it's, it's not an area that I practice. And so my okay. knowledge of it is much more limited. Okay. So this is my thing too. Like, obviously we're, we're nation on immigrants, right? But since the beginning of time, like in, in the, I think 1900s, there's all this, we don't hire at times, we don't hire Irish people when they had the yellow laws in the 1920s. Like it's like every generation have this no anti-immigration thing, but we're like then we're like oh we're it makes immigrants like how how do you like it's not actually more for us as a country we're like we're like so anti-immigrant but so pro-immigrant at the same time right it's always like it's like a crazy. bit of a tug of war I, yeah. you know and I think people are here for generations and generations and forget sort of hey somewhere in my lineage my family went through this process mm -hmm. to get here right but then you're here for a set long amount of time. And people have their own personal struggles. And I think that it's hard to see outside of yourself and realize that, yeah, we're a nation founded by immigrants. Like we are, a, you know, a diverse pool. And there's a reason that, that that exists and that that needs to continue to exist for us to succeed. So do you think there's any way we can stop, like, having these anti-immigration laws? Like I said back in the 1900s, like, we don't hire Italians or Irish and yellow laws. Like, if generally says anti-immigration, or this is that's part of the American process, unfortunately, right? I mean, I don't want to believe that it has to be. I don't. I, and I, you know, that's that's not the viewpoint I take. But obviously, there are people that have that, that have that sort of America first, people here first. Like, that's, you know, uh, this sort of concept that we don't need the rest of the world yeah. and that we are this silo that can exist alone. And I mean, but, you know, I can only speak for myself, but I just don't see how that's reality. Yeah, me neither. So let's just change subjects real fast. So what do you do for fun? Like fun hobbies, what do you do in your spare time? Like that yeah. kind of break loose, so to speak. Um, 
So, I mean, obviously life has shifted a bit now with having small kids. You tend to sort of have to be more of a homebody for the first few couple of years. Um, but traveling was always something I love to do. Cooking. My husband and I like to cook. Um, and then, you know, going being outdoors as much as we can. We try to go camping in the summers and we're starting to get back into that with the kids. And um, we have a couple camping trips planned coming up and just kind of remember that there is life outside of the day to day so grind. When you go camping, do you camp for real, like out in tents or you take the RV and like do the No, camping? we don't have an RV. We t we tent camp. For, for real but camping. I would say we're like sort of in between the yeah. hardcore. We, we, when we were younger and didn't have children, we would do more like hiking, yeah. camping. Now it's like we, you know, we've got our car right there. Yeah. But, okay. you yeah. know, we still set up tent and bring, you know, food. Do you have to any, cook. any favorite camping spots? Um, we last year we went to race our state park for for a camping trip, we're part of a a group. Uh, it's sort of or like for parents of multiples. And so it's like a, it exists for people who have singleton children. It's called PEPs. And then there's one for parents who have twins called PEMS. And they do like a, a camping trip. And so it's nice because it's like family friendly. And also we get to camp with a bunch of other twin parents and twin kids. And I didn't think misery. About that. So I, I never thought about it. So I guess there would be like a, some kind of twin community. Support There's group. A, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I didn't really have a lot of experience with it until I had my own. But um, yeah, there's a, a, a really nice support group. We, we had our kids, our girls in the middle of the pandemic. Right. So it was April 2021. And uh, it was very, very isolated. You know, we didn't no, Nobody was meeting in person. It was before the vaccine, you know, so especially being pregnant and in a high risk pregnancy, you had to really kind of just not go out into the world because we didn't know what COVID did yeah. to pregnant women. And then, you know, you're, I had been you know, a high risk pregnancy carrying two babies. And so uh, we did these zoom meetings with our, with our twin group once the girls were born and it was like, Oh, connection, commiseration, just being like, this is so hard and it's so beautiful. And like, how do you balance having two kids at one time? And, I'm a first time mom. So, you know, I didn't have walk, like, walk, like walking to motherhood, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, here you go going from childless to children, you know, in one one day. So it was really it was it. I don't know that we would have really survived it, like sort of mentally without having that support. And um, we still are friends with our, our group. There was like six families in our they try to pair you with people who had babies at the same time, of course. And so um, have you noticed like you always hear like twins have like a like a like the own language and stuff. Have you know have noticed sort of like can I communicate differently with each other? No, anything like that. I you know I don't think I ever noticed them having like their own. I mean they do have their own language, but maybe not in the way that we think of it. Of of like they're not like making up fake words or at least yet. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that still comes, but I do think that they have like an understanding of each other that is sometimes doesn't even require words. You know, um, and uh, they are they're they very much have this connection that like I've never seen in siblings before so it's it's kind of a, it's like magical and weird yeah. and and uh but like I'm, I'm just in awe of it all the time yeah so often you know, you're doing like a lot of roles with all the stuff you're doing how do you make sure you take care of yourself like physically mentally how do you make sure you like you take care of Marshall I don't think I was for the first couple of years I was definitely just sort of like you know you're in like this survival mode of you know just getting through the day and definitely prioritizing everybody else's needs, you know, ahead of your own your kid, you know, my kids, of course, first. Uh, now I'm starting to feel like, OK, I'm getting a full night's sleep every night. I So which means like I can actually wake up and feel like I can do more than just survive. Right. Uh, so I'm like getting back to like going and doing things to feel more healthy, working out, like reading books again. Um, you know, going, have like actually going out of the house without the kids, having somebody come in, you know, we have like a wonderful nanny that comes for, sometimes and helps us out. Um, not feeling guilty about being like, we're going to go out to dinner tonight, or we're going to go to this birthday party for our friends and leave the kids behind. Um, I, you know, finally feel like we can do some of these things for ourselves again, which is nice. Nice. So like, you know, on TV, a law is like glamorous and sexy, right? You're like Matlock, LA Law, all these different law firm stories on TV. Yeah. The law is like this the superhero and saves the day. But I'm guessing reality is the opposite, right? Can you like kind of tell like the like day day? Like, I mean, there's some days I feel like, wow, I really lawyered. <laughs> you know, like I had, <clears throat> excuse me, a really challenging case that I felt really proud about. And then there's a lot of days where it's just like a lot of paperwork. 
It's a lot of checking boxes, making sure field. And that that's important, too. I mean, there's lawyering in that, but it's just, it's yeah, you're right. It's not the, like, catching somebody telling a lie on the stand kind of lawyering. But um, I still, I think every little bit of it is important in its different ways. And, and you know, we take it in, seriously and, and realize that, yeah, it might be a box checked on a form or a field filled out or not filled out, but that can make or break something sometimes. You know, a case could be rejected, which can have, a domino effect if somebody's like, this has to be filed at this time, or I lose my status, or I lose my work authorization. You know, there's really serious repercussions, even to the smallest thing. So we try to remind ourselves, I think that it it's imp even the little things are important, just as the big victories are where we feel like, whoa, I had a conversation or I had a, you know, had to call Customs and Border Protection and and help somebody get across the border today. And I get off that call and feel like, oh, I've got to kind of advocate like in not in person, but on a call with the government and get somebody through or, you know, those things are maybe sometimes feel like the bigger victories, but I think they're, they come in small versions too. When you like do a call with someone and, you, and it can be anyone, right? And you, and you introduce yourself to the lawyer, do you feel like you get more respect because you say I'm a lawyer versus I'm just Marcer? Do you think that's that kind of advice people give lawyers? Uh, I mean, I think sometimes it can go both ways. They'll be like, oh, a lawyer, I'm right? I mean, it yeah. depends on their perception. Here's a, here's a, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I mean, I think one of the reasons I became a lawyer ultimately is I think so when I was in undergrad, I went I'm a banana slug. I went to UC Santa Cruz. That's their their, uh, you know, mascot. I'm very proud of that. And um, my last year, I did a program called UCDC where uh, I think it was like maybe 20 or 25 uh, students uh, from all the UCs in the system. So like UC uh, Davis and Irvine, UCLA, they all send about 20 or 25 students to Washington, D.C. We all lived in like a building that was built with like dorms or, or like apartments and then classrooms on the bottom. And then we were required to do an internship as well anywhere in, in the D.C. area. And so I did mine with the World Organization Against Torture. They changed their name to the World Organization for Human Rights, I think, like right as I was leaving that that fall. But um, in in my capacity as an intern that that fall, I was, you know, providing like information to detained individuals. We had we had an attorney there that was helping individuals with like asylum cases. Um, and there was like one in person moment where I remember there was like a woman who was from I think she was from a, a country in Africa and she was trying to explain something to that attorney about like a cultural sort of norm for her. Um, and 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 in, in, in a moment, she like kind of looked at me because I think he wasn't quite getting it. She's like, well, you understand, right? Because like she could see that obviously I'm not, you know, like a white male who uh, who was the attorney at the time. And and I did because like I come from a culture where, you know, it, like I think in that instance, there was something it had something to do with like her relationship and they were trying to prove it was a bona fide relationship and it related to her visa case. And they were asking about like living together before marriage and things like that. And so um, what what struck me in that moment was just a, sort of a like, I as a woman and a woman from a you know a different cultural background, you know have a different perspective and can maybe also understand different stories of individuals that are going through this process differently than somebody that maybe is more far removed from it or doesn't have that in their background. And then if I am in a position of power or privilege, I can be an advocate for those individuals in a, in a specific way. And so, I think that is what for me becoming a lawyer in whatever capacity it ended up being at the time I didn't know. That's what made me feel like it was an important goal is to to put myself in a position where I could do that, where I could advocate for people. And so tell me again, what year in college was it when you decided to go to law school? Um, so I didn't decide in college. I think that was sort of like a, a, a like a light bulb moment of okay. that was my senior year at UCSC. And it was like a light bulb moment of like, okay, I think I kind of I'm starting to understand what I want to do. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it means becoming a lawyer. I don't know if it becomes being a public policy advocate or whatever. But it started that like sort of wheel churning, right, for me. And how tough is it to get into law school? You always hear like law school is hard, medical school is hard. Is it really that hard? Like, I'm guessing you, yeah. you, you have to have like a 4.0 grad point average, like no, a perfect student. Or I definitely didn't have a 4.0, but... Um, Okay, you had a three point nine nine. I had something in the three point five or above. I I believe, but um, I actually took two years bef before okay. I went to law school. I, I 
kind of realized that I knew sort of what I wanted to do, but I didn't know if that was exactly it. And I wanted to work in that field in some capacity and see if it was something that called to me in, in or, if, or if I went and worked at law firms and was like, oh, this is the last thing I want to do. So I worked in um, San Francisco. So was, I'm from the Bay Area originally. My family's there. And um, so when I graduated, I uh, moved to Berkeley. I worked in San Francisco for two firms for two years and uh, kind of, and I was like a case assistant, sort of a paralegal legal assistant hybrid. Um, so I worked closely with lawyers and I kind of tried to see what, what it was like for them and whether I felt drawn to it. And some lawyers, I was like, what do you think about going to law school? Or like, oh, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't do it, you know? And others were like, yeah, it's the best decision I ever made. And I, I love it. Um, then I, you know, applied to different law schools. You have to take uh, the LSATs and then, you know, based on the scores and you're great, you know, then you sort of decide where you can go. I still had this idea of like, I want to go somewhere that had a really like a mission of service. And um, I applied to a few in the Bay Area, but I also looked up in Seattle and um, saw that Seattle University's law school had a really strong social justice mission and uh, came up and toured it. And I felt like, oh, wow, this, this school really like the students didn't seem like burnt out and free, you know, like there was just like this vibe that I liked. Uh, and I and it felt very collegial. And um, I got a bit of a scholarship to go there that didn't, you know, hurt, obviously. Uh, so it, it felt like the right step for me based on where I was at that moment and sort of what my priorities were as far as like why I wanted to become a lawyer. So let's do this. Like suppose there's somebody out there, they want to be a lawyer. They're supposed to have the grades to get in, like where that in life, right? Do two things. Do one thing where you convince them to be a lawyer and follow up with like convince them why they should not be a lawyer. Well, if whenever somebody has asked me, like, should I go to law school? I've always told them, don't go to law school unless you know you want to be a lawyer. Um, so I think there's definitely a pool of people who graduate are like, oh, I don't know what I want to do. And I don't want to be like a doctor or, you know, go into like engineering. So I'm just going to go to law school and see what happens. Um, but they don't really want to to really do anything with the law and probably could get like a master's in something and and do exactly what they want to do without the mountain of debt that can often follow from law school. Um, so I, you know, I, I usually start with that. Like, is like, what do you, do you know what you want to do? And, and if so, like, is this what you need to do to get there? I mean, it's not just obviously the, the debt. It's three years. It's a, a very stressful time. I mean, it's challenging. It's consuming. Um, you know, you get that talk on, I think, the first week of law school, probably that you get in med school, too, of like 50 percent of relationships fail once you start school in, in these professions because it's it's so all consuming. Um, and so, you know, it, it, that just kind of tells you sort of the level of stress and, and sort of challenge that you're about to experience. So all in all, if the, if the, if the outcome is not to become a lawyer or, or that you need a law degree to do what you want to do, then, you know, obviously consider other options given all of that. Um, but on the flip side, my experience with law school was great. I mean, I, I don't regret it if people, when people ask me if the question, I think I asked those lawyers when I was a case assistant, I say, I don't have any regrets and it's exactly what I would do again. Um, I went to a law school that was incredibly supportive. I love the teachers. I love my my friends and the friendships I made there. I was really involved, which helped a lot. You know, I was the like I said, I was on in the South Asian Law Student Association. I did clinics. I was in the Women's Law Caucus. I was a article editor on the Seattle Journal of Social Justice. So you know, I felt like I really dove in and took as much out of that experience as I could, and and I left it feeling. Even though I graduated during a recession where there were no jobs, I still felt like I, you know, had a lot of support from that community and it was the right choice for me. So I, I think if you go to like middle school, you have a lot of debt. And I could be wrong. I think if you're a doctor, you, you have like other debt. I think there's a program where like if you go become a doctor, like a country doctor, like, you know, like small town, the government like pays your debt off. There's a program like that for lawyers too, where they get like up, like yeah. small country lawyers somewhere. It, there's some. Some programs, the I mean, government programs for people that go into public interest work. And I, I forget if you have to work 10 or 20 years for it to be forgiven, but oh God, yeah. it's still a long, yeah, it, Lord. it's still a long time, even if you are doing pu public interest work for that whole period. 
Um, so I think maybe five years. You said ten or twenty. Yeah, I can't remember which one it is, but um, and I know that I, 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 this administration has had some some initiatives to help relieve that for cer certain students, but uh, I have not been fortunate to, yeah. enough to get any of those. My thing is, why would anyone like? Be a want to be a lawyer doctor. You, the three years of school, the high debt. You know, it's like like if you're, if you're a doctor, they don't. I'm, I'm pretty sure like a law lawsuit so don't teach how to be a, like a business person, right? There's no business school for lawyers. Like if you want to like open your own practice, oh like college. no, there. Um, I mean, no, yeah, there isn't. There are some like I know Seattle U has a specific program to help people that want to become solo practitioners. Yeah. They have like a um, like a mentorship sort of help mm -hmm. program for that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't know about with doctors. Okay. I think that people that go leave law school or med school and go into that line of work where they are working at country doctor or working at, you know, nonprofits are, you know, they're not doing it because they have no other choice of doing it because yeah. they love it and they that this is where they feel needed and where they can best use their skills and their expertise. So for lack of a better term, is there some kind of like, you know, um lawyer um customer service form, like a Yelp for lawyers where people can go on this that like so you could Mar go on Yelp. <laughs> Marshall gave me this great service or, you know, yeah. had a bad experience. There's something like there where people can look at it when they're looking for lawyers. Yeah, I mean, they're literally, yeah. People, Yelp, people for real? go on Yelp. Yelp, okay. Google reviews. Um, there's a site called Avo. I've heard of Avo before. Yeah, and that's specific to lawyers where you can go. It, you can go in and you can actually ask questions mm -hmm. and um, some times lawyers can respond and then there's ratings. So that's more law, you know, legal specific. Okay. But no, literally, yeah, we get Yelp and, and Google reviews. So I think a lot of times, like, I don't think... Most people don't have like a lawyer on a retainer, right? People can afford that. But most people need a lawyer, like, you know, right now, like they maybe get a DOI or like they get in trouble with the law or whatever the case may be, right? They need a lawyer then. And like, if you Google like a lawyer, like all these options come up. How does someone can realistically like pick the best lawyer from them, right? With um, so, I mean, a lot of the work that we get is through referrals. And I mean, like okay. we always say that the best, highest compliment we can get is a referral because mm -hmm. that means that we did a good job well enough that somebody else is saying, hey, this go to this lawyer. She's awesome. Um, and other times it's referrals through, you know, you know, cl corporate clients or things like that. But um, yeah, it, it varies how it happens. How you choose an attorney can be through. I mean, I, I would say definitely getting somebody else's experience is a good way to understand if it's the right fit for you. But then just a consultation is a good idea. Sometimes it's not a good fit. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you feel like, I just need an informational, like I'm on the right track. Obviously, as a lawyer, I'm usually like, it's good to have somebody guide you through the process. Um, immigration law is a bit different than maybe criminal or family in the sense that I think maybe a large number of people do go through the process without a lawyer, especially the, the family-based side, right? Um, and sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't. Obviously, if you're you're kind of dabbling in it by doing your own thing, you may not be aware of new policies, procedures, fee increases, or what to do if you hit a roadblock. And so our goal, and, and sometimes it starts in the consult, is like to gather all the information and understand like what are your personal challenges? What are you coming to seek help with? Can we help you? And how can we map this out? Like here's the, what I always aim to do in a consult is explain like myself, what I do, and then learn about them. I usually go through their history and try to find any red flags. Like, oh, you overstayed on this particular stay. That could be, be an issue for you. Or, you know, did you have a criminal issue in the past or things that could trigger problems if you file for, you know, any sort of immigration benefit. So that's like step one. And then once, if we, if we do represent somebody, then it's getting them through the system. It's, it's a, I mean, as we've discussed, it's a, a high volume complex system that can be challenging to understand and figure out. And you're not able to just, well, you can pick up a phone and call CIS, but whether that'll get you anywhere is another question. So how do you keep the balance? Like, you know, having like a personal relationship with your, your with your client, so to speak, at the same time, you have this overwhelming number of people you have to deal with, right? How do you, how do you keep the client? From uh, I mean, overwhelming the number? we don't do, I don't do it alone. I have, you know, I work with an amazing group of professionals. Um, we have, awesome paralegals that really are like the heart of the case. They keep us organized. They keep, you know, they, they usually do the drafting of the petitions. They monitor the cases as they go through their sort of life cycle, whatever the type of case might be. Um, and, and like, if it's a family-based case, 
you know, we're doing check-ins with them. If it's a, it's a corporate client, because, you know, the other side is that we have these clients that we work with. Some might have one or two cases a year. Some might have a steady stream of foreign nationals. They might be, that might be a significant part of their workforce. And we are tracking and monitoring dates and statuses and expirations and trying to make sure that there's no sort of gaps or glitches in that, that prevents somebody from continuing to live and work and, and their life in the U.S. And then is the next step like employer sponsorship. So then we're kind of going through that navigation. And, you know, as, as we talked about, there's changes all the time to the system. All of a sudden there's a new policy, there's a new executive order, there's a new fee increase and making sure that they're aware of that. And if that does pose a unique challenge, you know, how do we get ahead of it with them? So I know on, on, on your bio, on your website, for your company you work for, it says you do pro, pro bono work. I think most lawyers like do some kind of pro bono work. Is that just like a requirement to be as a lawyer, you got to do a center for bono work? Is that, is that no. as an individual division, individual decision, each lawyer do pro bono work? How's that work? Uh, no, it's not a requirement to be, a, you know, as an attorney, you have no requirement to do pro bono work. Um, different firms have different sort of mottos and support levels of it. Different attorneys have their own priorities. Uh, I, over my career, my pro bono work has shifted. I've um, done clinics. The King County Bar Association has neighborhood clinics, one of which is an immigration clinic. I did that for a number of years. Um, we have citizenship days here through um, uh, nonprofits that host at One America. And um, then the biggest, one of the biggest nonprofits in our, our region is called the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. And they have a list of pro bono attorneys that, you know, they'll send like case, cases that come in to to distribute and then you can take on. And I, I try to have a, a couple of those at all times. So you belong to a lot of organizations. I'm not going to name all of them, but one is American Immigration Lawyer Association uh, and some other ones, right? Can you just talk about the work you do with those? Like, yeah. like highlight one or two you want to talk about and like the work they do? Yeah. So the American Immigration Lawyer Association, so I was mentioning that, you know, our it's our immigration bar association, basically. And it's unique because as we talked about earlier, you know, we're we're much more kind of collegial. We like share information and data and insights and trends and timelines within our kind of immigration bar because we're all sort of doing the same work, not against each other, but, you know, filings with the government. And so um, every state has its own chapter of this national bar uh, for Washington state. I've been involved since 2013 as a member, but then also on the executive committee in varying positions. And then in 2019 to 2021, I was the chair for the state of Washington for our local chapter. And um, it's, I mean, it's amazing, amazing group of immigration professionals doing all, all the types of immigration work, you know, business and family and removal, defense, et cetera. Um, and it's great because we also then have these connections with the government too, through our, uh, our organization. So our local USCIS office, uh, CBP, um, you know, ICE, we try to build these relationships through that bar association. And then it's really information dissemination. We're telling them the challenges we are seeing. They're giving us information to better help individuals going through the process. Sometimes that door is open. Sometimes that door is more closed. Again, this goes back to our, our sort of the administration in charge at the time. So what's your, your own personal career goal? Like, do you want to one day be an immigration judge or you want to start your own law firm? Like, what's your, like, you have like a nope. long-term career goal? Um, I um, uh, I don't do that type of work anyway, so I wouldn't be a good immigration judge. I, I'm, I'm not in court. I'm not doing the court work. Um, but uh, what I'm doing now is what I love to do. And I'm, you know, I'm sort of like living it. I have a great team at Ryan Swanson that I work with. And um, we are, you know, we're doing work with amazing clients across all industries. One of the things that I've always kind of loved about my sort of chosen practice area is that we get to work with all kinds of clients. Like sometimes I'm working with an architecture firm. Sometimes I'm working with an accounting firm. Sometimes I'm working on an extraordinary ability case for an ICE artist. Uh, sometimes I'm, you know, doing pro bono work, but I, I'm like learning about so many different fields and, uh, you know, engineers and doctors, you know, naturopathic physicians and medical technologists and, uh, it just kind of keeps me always interested in what I'm doing because, I mean, I'm I'm focusing on the immigration part of it, of course, but I have to learn about what they do. I have to learn a, to some degree and be able to speak that language because I'm translating that into the laws and 
and the applications, the petitions that we file in a way that makes sense to the government to understand here's what this person does and here's why it fits into whatever visa category we're talking about. So can you talk real fast about some of the people who, are, who have, have been your mentors either right now or in the past? Yeah. So um, I, I feel like I've been so incredibly lucky to have the, just like the most supportive um, community behind me. And, you know, that started back in law school with having an amazing professor that, you know, kind of believed in me and, and, and brought me down there for that oral argument uh, before the court gave me the connections to go to Costa Rica and work with the UNHCR. And that's Professor Ed Koviak. And then when I was figuring out my next steps and through my connections made with the South Asian Bar Association, um, I was introduced to Judge K2 Shaw. Uh, at the time, he was an immigration lawyer and a pro tem judge. And he, you know, gave me my first chance, basically, and said, yeah, come in and work with me and like taught me sort of the first things I ever learned about uh, business immigration and uh, helped mentor me and kind of get me started in the field. Um, he's now he's still a judge now. That's what he does fully. But, uh, you know, uh, that was like my launching point. And that's when I met like, the mentors that I have now, um, you know, that brought me into Ryan Swanson, Joel Padgett, Janet Cheatham. Um, I, these are my, my partners that I work with, my immigration lawyers as well, Amy Royalty. And they've all kind of helped me along the road of, of learning and knowing what it means to be a lawyer. But I always tell law students is like you'd learn to be a lawyer once you actually start practicing. Like you go to law school, you learn how to think like a lawyer, you learn how to write like a lawyer, sort of in this abstract intellectual way. And then once you are practicing, that's when you're kind of shaped and guided and, and taught how to actually do the lawyering. And those individuals are the ones who've done that for me and believed in me and supported me and who I've modeled my, my lawyering styles after a little bit of each of them is kind of what makes up who, who I've become today. And next part to me, the more important part of the question, who are you mentoring right now? So, um, you know, in our, in our, uh, firm, we have, you know, associates that come up and we assign mentors to them. I have two individuals, one who's one of the associate attorneys in my group, Jen Chen, and then I also work with another associate, Kyung Sun, and uh, Park, who is, you know, assigned as my mentees. Um, I try to kind of do what I can to share my experience and help support them, not just as, uh, as lawyers, but just as like women in the field, individuals in the field, sort of about making that balance. Um, recently, a colleague of mine, Cody Nunn and I went to UW and spoke before sort of a group of pre-law students who are, you know, just finishing their bachelors and thinking about law school and becoming a lawyer. And that was an interesting, like me remembering and, and sort of reliving like what were, what was I thinking at that point in time and trying to share again, just as a, as a mentor, as somebody in the field, the things, the challenges that I was going through at that time as well. So when you, you decided to work for your current law firm, was it a combination of like you picking them or was it more than recruiting you, a combination? Like, how did you decide to go to this law firm versus the other it has opportunities? It go both ways. Um, I, I mean, they didn't, like, reach out to me and say, hey, we heard about you. You know, I was a young, a young lawyer, and um, I had been practicing for, like, two or three years at the time. But uh, I was introduced to Janet Cheatham through another immigration lawyer who, you know, I had just had, like, a coffee with to be like, how do I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for next steps. Um, and then just through, again, like it's, I think it's always comes back to networking and meeting new people and opening up doors and connections in that way. It, my, one of my other mentors is, um, was, is a in-house counsel at Starbucks. And I met her through the diversity fellowship that Starbucks has. Her name's Jane Kaufman. And she was huge in my sort of early, early years of lawyering and trying to figure out like, where do I go? What do I do? How do I navigate the system? I didn't, I didn't take the traditional path, right? Like a lot of people went to law school. They did a summer associate at a firm that turned into an offer at that firm. And then there you go. There's your career, right? Um, I went to law school, graduated. There was no job opportunities. Went to Costa Rica did that for a few months, came back. Um, and so, you know, as I was sort of figuring this out, I she was so, such an amazing mentor for me to be like, okay, here's how you speak to a law firm. Here's how you, like, let me translate what they're saying 
to you in this hiring process. And um, so that's, these are all sort of ways in which I've been trying to also help, you know, when I speak to people going through the same process, I try to give them that bridge and that door as well, like open that door for them as well if I can. And so you're like, you're happy with your job now, but is there a job out there you'd like, you'd have to consider, like suppose someone said, hey, we're going to put you to be the state director of immigration policy for ICE or some kind of government thing, something like there's anything out there like kind of like would at least yeah. pique your interest? Um, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> there was a time when I thought well, it would be interesting to be involved in the creation of policy and to do sort of the research work around that and um, kind of be involved in the decisions that set those policies instead of being somebody that is helping people navigate through them once they're set. But, um, you know, if something like that presented itself, then I, I'm not saying I wouldn't consider it. Um, it was when I was chair of the Immigration Lawyers Association for Washington State, one of the things that we do each year that all the chapters do around the, you know, across the country is uh, called National Day of Action. And we go to Washington, D.C., and we have a uh, meeting set up with our members of Congress. And we basically just go and speak to them about sort of we're immigration attorneys. Here's here's what we see in the system that needs to be addressed. Here's stories of our clients. Like we want to bring people's lot, like like how this is really impacting lives to you. And uh, so we, I did that in March 2020, which was like a really interesting time to be doing that because obviously started the pandemic. We got to D.C. and found out that the entire, pretty much the entire delegation for the state of Washington was on a plane with Vice President Pence headed back to Washington because as you probably remember, Washington was like the start of COVID, right? Um, so they were all coming back to be like, what's going on? How, you know, what's happening in Washington? Uh, and uh, so we got there and, but we still were able to meet with, with you know, there was a, a couple people still, a couple, uh, I remember we met with Senator Cantwell at the time and uh, in 2020, and then uh, it's chiefs of staff for other representatives were there. And so we were still able to sit down and just have these conversations. And it was, it was great because it was not just Democrats. You would think that only the, the you know, Congress members that are Democratic would be open to even having that discussion. But, you know, luckily in Washington state, we have Republican members of Congress who also understand the importance of immigration and, um, you know, see that in their, the how that impacts lives of their constituents. And so those conversations and that experience, to me, I was like, wow, this, this work is amazing. Like I could see doing this at some point in my life, how that would work out or when, you know, when that opportunity present, I don't know, but it was a little bit of a glimpse of, of the impact you can make if you're on that side of the conversation, you're having those conversations with decision makers and members of Congress. So, yeah, I think I'd be open to it if, if there was. Well, but basically you found your life's work already, right? And, yeah. And so many people would live the whole life and don't find the life's work. So that's really good for you. Yeah, I think I found my life's work. I think it was like a, a, a windy road of, of, I don't don't know how I got there, but it was a, a lot of different experiences in like related, but not exactly what I'm doing right now, roles and experiences. But um, I find a lot of um, joy in what I do in helping people and helping. I mean, you know, what we do is not just individuals, but clients, corporate clients and sort of helping them figure out and support their employees and and understand how to navigate the system. It's it's I find it enriching. So I'll probably make this, this up. But there's something out there show that shows I'm trying to make it's something that shows that you know like let's suppose in the year 2022 we had a, a million immigrants right either illegal 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 the million immigrants came across the border right or came to the country right there's some data stat that shows like X percentage would become homeless X percentage would become on welfare X percentage would become like like categorize it some kind of way it's just like no is is there some data that could categorize it that yeah. way I am not sure I I mean I think that individuals that come in undocumented certainly the resources are limited and and also it's like just finding those resources uh, i just attended the northwest immigrant right galas um they have a annual fundraising gala and was reminded of sort of the importance of organizations like that that exist um because they were founded out of this need of you know all these individuals coming here and feeling like there is no support system to help them figure out what are the steps? How do I seek support? And I know we've talked about people that, you know, you're like, well, what about the people that come in and lie or are just trying to game the system? And sure, there's always going to be some segment of that. But the majority of these people are here 
genuinely seeking support and refuge and protection. And, um, you know, I think organizations like that, um, that are there to educate, inform and provide those resources um, are just invaluable in our community. So how true is this, right? And, you know, this is not a new source, but I, I heard this on Joe Rogan podcast a couple weeks ago, right? You know, and, and of course, a lot of people do get news from Joe Rogan, you know, because he does a lot of good guests. But he's talking to someone in there and they were saying that, like, when someone crosses a border, the Biden administration buys a plane ticket to New York City. And in New York City, gives like $10,000 debit card, right? Is that accurate? Is it inaccurate? Like, um, no. So, I, well, I think what you're what you've seen probably more, more in the news these days is how different governors from different states have been shipping immigrants. Have you have you been yeah. seeing that yeah. where they're like, well, you know, they're all coming to our state and we're not getting enough federal support. So we're going to put them on a plane and we're going to send them to Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. Or we're going to send them to Seattle or to states that are more supportive of, of um, individuals coming in seeking help. And actually here in Seattle, we have um, a group of attorneys in partnership with NERP that is helping. Um, there's a, a large group of refugees right now here just in Tequila. And I think they're being housed at uh, like a church. And uh, again, this is sort of what I love about my immigration bar and community. Immediately upon hearing of sort of this crisis of these individuals that were, were sent over here by another state, they came together, they put together a clinic. They have found housing for them and they've put together through a partnership with the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and a group of attorneys, Paul Sora, Esther Greenfield and some par and other uh, attorneys have gotten together and they're helping them navigate and put together TPS applications as temporary protected status applications and reviewing asylum options for them. Um, and and that, that I think is where we need to figure out how best to support individuals that come across instead of saying, Okay, well, either A, we're just going to detain you indefinitely or and like put you through some quick asylum process that's barely touching upon the experiences you've had or, you know, put you on a plane to another state because we want to deal with you. Just having that resources and then having so that man. The states that do this, you think they're doing a bad, good thing, bad thing? Because it's not like I think they're trying to prove a point. I yeah, think I mean, they, that's, that's they, they think yeah. they're trying to they're making some yeah. sort of point. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, because you're like your state of Texas, Arizona, like you don't have the resources. It's supposed to be like a, a federal government thing to do and they're not doing it. Yeah, so we're just gonna like put them on a plane, pay yeah, for them. Some, some of these communities I do think are hypocritical. Like you brought up Martha, Martha Winyard. I can make make this up, but I think Martha Winyard is like kind of liberal. They're like for immigration, and then when Texas sent these people immigrants there, it's like within days they got they sent them to New York City or something, right? I could be totally making that one. Like you're pro immigrant, like then you have you have then you deal with it. Yeah, yeah, you got opportunity to help these people, and then they ship them off too. I think like I yeah, can, which I can totally make that up. You it's know? not smart because you're just overstraining other states. I mean, it's not that they're not pro immigrant, but we also don't have the resources for any one particular state to yeah. you know handle the influx. And so, so I mean, should there be man? I hate to use it. Should there be some kind of like I don't know federal institution camp or something like. Of course, that goes down a slippery slope. You know? Yeah. Well, as we know from history, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, there are these detention centers that exist. Yeah. And we all saw during the last administration, kids in cages and all all yeah, these sort not, of... Definitely not a good look. Yeah. All these sort of um, attempts to contain, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in not humane ways at all. Yeah. Like I'll say, like, people way smaller than me, way more money, hadn't figured this out yet, right? So... Right. And, uh, and way smarter than me. Yeah. I mean, I can only kind of hypothesize but yeah because i think like um i know i think what's called the i-9 law i can't remember it's called immigration something law it goes but it's only passed in 1986 in the Reagan administration so even back then we've been dealing with this sort of speed. yeah that and that that applies so you're talking about the form i-9 which I mean, yeah. as an hr professional yeah. i'm sure you yeah. get a lot of questions about but yeah every, every, anybody employed in the u.s if you're a w-2 employee you go through that whether you're a u.s citizen or a an individual who's only temporarily eligible to work um, and that I that is specific to confirming your identity and your work authorization. And for such a simple form, you would think, well, this is like easy yeah. peasy and no. it is not, uh, yeah. yeah. No, it's not unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's and, and it is one of the ways that the government is trying to enforce ensuring that employers are taking the right steps and not employing individuals without work authorization. Right. And so uh, there are audits, uh, that are conducted sometimes at random, sometimes on complaint that go through and ensure that you are complying, that you are verifying that within three days of them yeah. beginning work with you. You're completing the sections appropriately. You're obtaining the right documents and <clears throat> that you're not asking inappropriate questions or asking for documentation yeah. 
that could violate yeah. you no know, anti discrimination laws. Yeah, that's how I tell people like for HR, like the odds are the give them argue is probably slim to none. However, what happens is like some employees are gonna file a complaint against you and then you look at everything, right? Because they figure you did this one thing wrong, you did everything wrong. Right. And the the penalties can be high if if they find that there's some sort of pattern or practice of no know, knowingly hiring individuals or asking questions that are inappropriate or even how you preserve the documentation. Like do you keep the copy of the driver's license and the social security card? Do you do that for everybody or do you do it only for the individuals that you think like, hmm, maybe they're not, you know, and that, yeah. that of course cannot can appear as if you are conducting a discriminatory practice. So part of what we do is help with that compliance issue with clients and making sure that even though it feels like the simplest thing, I can tell you that one of my colleagues always says like, give me 10 I-9s and I'll do a free audit for you. <laughs> If I find zero errors, I won't charge you for my time. That would never happen. And it, it's a, yeah, almost every, no, every time we will find that there is errors in the I-9 completion. Yeah. There's errors in their policy. They're not, uh, maybe they're asking some, but not everybody for documentation. Maybe they're asking people like, give me your green card. You know, like yeah. you, you cannot. Well, you have maybe to, the document is like spiral license from 2021, you know. Well, license driver's license is it, it's fine. You don't have to re-verify those. Those can be I'm fair, yeah. I'm fair, like, people oh, when, when they, they turn when they yeah. yeah. Um, or maybe they're not re-verifying. Maybe somebody gave them a work permit two years ago that expired yeah. and they never thought like, oh wait, I've got to re-verify that I nine. So part of what we do is help in that compliance issue, or if there is an audit, which currently I think it was in the last couple months, the government said like, well, our focus right now is going to be more targeted on like complaints. We're not, we're not doing as many random, but, um, but when you are audited, like, what do you, how do you handle that? How do you deal with your employees when you look at your I-9s and you go, oh no, we didn't do a very good job. Now we've got to tell our workforce, we've got to figure out how to fix it. We've got to let them know we're being audited in a lot of cases. And you still run your business, you know, hopefully. So now you got to take time out of running your business to yeah. do this government stuff that and in most cases, it's just a government um, contractor showing up at your front desk and saying, "Hey, I'm from the government. I need to see your I-9s." And sometimes they'll have they'll have a a, a notice, and um, and they give you like three days to respond. They're like, "You've got three days to turn over all your your I-9 paperwork," and and usually that's when we get a call and we say, "Okay, well, we're going to contact them. We're going to give you an extension. We're going to do a review. We're going to figure out what you can fix. We're going to tell you how to to let your employees know so that you can get." folks in to fix anything because you know you can't fix section one yeah. um and a lot of times you know sometimes when they let their workforce know people don't show up again for work right because I mean, yeah you're right yeah and, and that's okay um the, that's one way of saying okay well yes these per people were apparently not work authorized not employed with us anymore but how do you sort of navigate that um and not you know and and make sure you get out of it without like huge penalties <laughs> or Worse, right? Yeah, yeah. So me and you met at this uh, Seattle Chamber of Commerce networking event, I think dating event about maybe a month or two ago. Yeah. So like why in your in your position, you're a successful lawyer, you know, why still network? Why do you still feel important to network? I, I mean, like we've been saying, I think throughout, I to me, networking, being in the community, being, you know, making those connections with folks is, it's been what I've done from day one that I feel like has helped me to kind of be successful and, and kind of move up in my career, but also just stay connected in the community, um, meet new people, learn about businesses and business needs. I don't think there's really ever a time that you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, certainly there's times when I'm doing it more and at times when I'm doing it less. Um, you know, like I said, I'm kind of coming out of this like couple years of intense parenting with young kids and I'm sort of returning to uh, to that part of like, being involved, being in the community, networking, meeting new people. Um, and I'm always excited to like learn about new businesses and figure out like where they might need support or help or how we can be of service. And, you know, it might just be like, hey, we are just, we've just hired our first ever, like this has never come up in an interview, but this person just told me I need sponsorship. We don't know what that means. Um, and sometimes it's a company that's maybe got a pretty good workforce of foreign nationals and realizing like, they need more support than they have at the moment. Um, but whatever it is, it's always kind of exciting and a new challenge for us to, to start that relationship with um, employers or, or you know, obviously for individuals as well. So let's suppose like there's a case you do and it's successful, right? What are, what are the success of that case is successful? Are you able to like, you know, kind of highlight that on social media, like, hey, we got this done for Cabernet HR, 
that kind of part of social media is like, oh, like, there's a lot of like, like how like stuff. Well, like I mean, that. as an attorney, you know, obviously we have confidentiality mm -hmm. with our clients. So, so sometimes yes. And sometimes no, I mean, you can get permission from okay. clients and sometimes it's a case that you're like, wow, I, I would love to be able to sing from the mountains that we, it's been years of going through this. And, you know, and a lot of attorneys will post pictures with like their, their clients who just were naturalized in front of the American flag. being like, Hey, I'm a U.S. citizen and I've helped them since they were undocumented. But, you know, you can do that. But of course, you need to have permission first okay. consent from your clients because you don't want to breach attorney client confidentiality. Yeah. So the, the is there like I know medical is called HIPAA. Is there like a term for that for for lawyer client confidentiality? Is like it, an actual term? It, it is that it's, a, it's attorney client. That's all it's it's okay. Yeah, privilege. Right. So as an attorney, you are bound ethically to keeping your your client. So is that based on some kind of oath from like the 1400s or something? Like what? Are that I, I don't know from? when the oath came in, but yes, when when I. But when after I passed the bar, when I went to get my license, I had to go and take an oath with my hand raised and say, yeah, I will uphold all the tenants. And not breaking that no, hey, you know, like not no, generally. Yeah. No. Okay. yeah, generally, no, um, unless, you know, like there's, a, there's like a criminal element or something okay. or like harm. But yeah. Um, no, yeah, we are. It's there are specific RPCs that are rules of professional conduct, ethical rules around that relationship between uh, just like it is between a doctor. And it's and your patient yeah. attorneys have that with our clients as well. So how do you keep up to date with all the different law stuff that changed, like the professional development pieces? Like how you do that? Does like you have to do that on your own? Does the law firm you work for for provide that for you? Um, I mean, we do we do that as you know, our firm is multi practice. So you know, we're one segment of it. We're the immigration team. We have employment lawyers. We have real estate lawyers. We have business lawyers. Uh, we have litigation team, healthcare, um, and so uh, you know, our immigration group. We, um, AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, is a huge resource for for most lawyers in kind of keeping. They do that work for us, right? They have a they have a team that does advocacy and has you know keeps monitors the legislative sessions. They have a team that um, breaks down. We it's our AILA eight every day. We get an eight point email bulletin that says here are the things that happened today. Um, and then most of us you know have subscriptions to like USCIS email alerts and policies too. So we're we're keeping. Um, our eye on what's happening and making sure that we know. And, you know, I, I've been in a, roles of leadership with AILA for the last decade. We, my team, the, the group that I work with, we all, uh, several other attorneys are involved in it. And so they might be liaisons to CBP or CIS or Department of State. And we information share, you know, we make sure that we're all aware of what's happening out there. And so once you pass a, the bar exam, it's not like you got to take every five years, every seven years. Once you take the bar exam, you're a lawyer. Yeah. And unless you get disbarred, which I'm guessing has to be very hard to get disbarred, you're much a lawyer for life, correct? Yeah, you have to do some continuing legal education. So the the WSPA has requirements. The Washington State Bar Association has requirements that you, you, you're always learning. You're always taking a certain number of credits of continuing legal education. Most of us go to like conferences and things in our field that tend to meet those requirements. Um, but you know, there's certain number of credits there's a certain number of ethics credits you have to do um i think the the period is like two or three years every few years you report and show i took these courses and these classes and met the credits i think the wsba also included there's a new one for like um um I think say it's like diversity equity inclusion credit as well that was implemented recently so so i can't remember the term the term is but what is it called like you, you get your law degree in state of washington then you can also practice in Colorado, Nebraska. Breath uh, of process. Yeah, that's it, right. How does yeah. that work? Is that, are you... Well, as an immigration lawyer, it's federal law. So okay. actually. Well, you can practice all 50 states. We, yeah, and, I have. We and have, territories too, correct? We have, yeah, we have clients okay. in, not just in the state of Washington that we represent because we're representing it before the federal government, right? So right. Um, that is another, I guess, benefit. I mean, obviously it's easier to practice in the state. You work in in terms of making those connections with like local officials, like local government agencies, like our local CIS, our, you know, ICE, all these things. But um, yeah, we can, you know, represent clients nationwide essentially. And and we do. And and that's another awesome part of what I do is that I get to have that that breadth of, of uh, client base. Yes. Um... And so do you do, do anything on social media for yourself or your career or? Um, I mean, our we have a, a really good business development team mm -hmm. at my firm. And so they, you know, we have LinkedIn. We, you saw, I think you mentioned yeah. like a, a informational, we try to do sort of informational um, 
not not always webinars, but sometimes webinars that like I, my colleague Cody and I did one on the HOP lottery, um, explaining the new the system and this year the new beneficiary centric sort of adjustments made to the system. And so we try to put that out on like YouTube and things like that. Um, our firm does have like a Twitter account and things like that. So, you know, we try to kind of keep and we do um, kind of alerts to our client base. So we'll have like a, a, a list, a marketing list. And so if there's something big that's happening or coming down the pipeline, we try to post on all of those platforms like LinkedIn, email alerts, yeah. you know, tweet, whatever it might be. So you said you're happy right now, right? But after guessing the future, you're going to want to compete to be a part. I think it's called a partner, right? I'm a partner. You're a partner right now? Okay. So it makes it easier than like, how does one become a partner? So is it based on like, you have to like bring a certain amount of business for the law firm? Do you have to bring a certain amount of cases? Or is it like, um, I mean, different firms have different policies around that sort of not only what it means, how, how to get there, but also what it means to be a partner. Um, there's off and, and also how you come in. Are you like a lateral hire? Are you coming in as an associate? Oftentimes you're like an associate for seven years and then there's a vote on partnership. And is being a partner kind of the same as like being a tenure professor? Or they it means you're a business owner. You're okay. you're a partial business owner. You're you're all partial business owners of that business. Um, some firms have like multi-tier structures, like you can be equity or non-equity. So you'll get the title of partner, but you're not um, like a business owner. Um, our firm is equity partnership. And so, you know, I have about 20 partners and we're all you know, partial business owners um, and, you know, great group of lawyers who we all support each other fully. And because we're a multi-practice firm, we're not all doing the same area of law. It's really wonderfully collaborative because like yesterday I called my my partner, Paul Meyer, and I was like, hey, I've got a business question for you on how nonprofits are set up. He has a, this individual who's an immigration client is asking about it. I often do that with a lot of my partners in other areas. I'll call up Brittany Pierce, who's one of my employment lawyer partners and say, this is a immigration question, but there's an employment law aspect to it because it might involve, hire, involve hiring or termination or some other policy. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try to dabble in other areas. That's always dangerous. So I just walk across the hall or pick up my yeah. phone and I've got this amazing group of professionals who are resources for me and my clients as well. You are ever like partner meetings. Y'all be like, Hey, Jason, like, dude, you're slacking, right? You need to step your game up, right? <laughs> Not in that exact way, <laughs> but maybe something like, I mean, I think, yes, we do. We have monthly partnership meetings uh -huh. where we all get together after work and, you know, we have like usually dinner mm -hmm. catered in and we sit and we talk about the state of business and, you know, what are we seeing? What could use some improvement? How are people doing in our firm? Like, are, what can we do to better support the staff? We look at finances, we talk about, you know, all, all the usual sort of things that I think any business goes through, but there's the, you know, the 20-ish of us that, that do that. Okay. And then so, we have a management committee, an executive committee. Right. Is there a standard out there that says like, you know, for every lawyer should only handle like maybe 100 cases, 200 cases, like a, some kind of standard, like if you like have over this number of clients, it's too much, like any kind of um, standard? I don't plus. know that there's a number out there. I think I mean, professionally, you should be handling the volume of cases that you can still do an adequate, more than adequate, a great job advocating for your clients for. Um, immigration tends to be a higher volume of cases at once. A lot of times it's because um, the cases take so long to process. And also you're not just, it's not like a single point in time. Like you may have an employer call you and be like, hey, I got to hire this person. They're on an H-1B. I need to sponsor them. Can you, you know, help me do this filing so I, we could onboard them? And we kind of go through that process. So then they get, you know, we file, it gets approved. They start with this employer, but that's not the end of their journey. You know, H-1Bs are valid for six years and usually a lot of in three-year approval chunks. So we're monitoring that. We're making sure that six months before that, that expiration date, we're reaching out. We're talking to that employer. We're saying, okay, what's the long-term goal here? Because if you want to go beyond that six years, then you have to think about, permanent residency? Do you want to sponsor them? Do they have another path to that? Um, you know, so it's, it's immediate support and long-term vision. It, you know, it's, and that's one person in their employment. Like maybe they've got a team of hundred, you know, who knows of foreign nationals, depending on the employer. So um, it, it can vary. So based on that, your volume can be, I might have like 50 active cases that are in varying stages at any one time, but then in our like database, you know, that we sort of um, software system we use, 
we might be monitoring and tracking and getting reminders on much more individuals than that, but not immediately, you know, that need attention. So when a player comes here, they say, I want to sponsor, you know, whoever, right? How, how many do you actually think, know, like what the commitment is, right? Or you have to like educate them. Like, um, yeah, that's, a, the, that varies. It depends on if they, like some, some companies have very sophisticated global mobility teams, right? Like they are, that that's, a, a very key part of their workforce. They've developed a, you know, a robust sort of immigration policy and system and framework, and um, they have a global mobility team that manages that. Sometimes it's an employer who's like, I've never heard of this. What does this mean? <laughs> what is an EAD? You know, like, I, I can I even do this? Um, and, and then there's anything in between, you know? And so um, it, it's, it's interesting to work with both sides. It, sometimes it's nice to be like, okay, you know what this term means. Like, you know what an LCA is, you know what an H-1B is, you know what, um, you know, what USCIS is, like the agency that adjudicates this. Um, but it's also really nice to help somebody from the first day that they've ever learned about it. So an employer that's like, we don't have a policy, like, what does this mean? How do we do this? And um, it it can it can greatly vary. But I think our role as immigration lawyers is to either maybe help them create that foundation, understand what their company needs, talk through it with them and set up those policies. Like, do you want to say you got to work with us for a year before we even talk about green card sponsorship? But is that competitive in this market? Like, will somebody stay with you if they have to wait? And also going back to sort of, these are individuals that are here temporarily in the United States and they are lacking that stability, right? They're like always thinking about what's, do I have to leave in a in any particular time? How can I get my permanent residence? So you kind of have to think as an employer from a lot of that perspective as well. Like if this is somebody you're investing in, which really sponsoring somebody is an investment yeah, for the company. Time investment. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, you, you're, you've probably advised on this when you talk, talk to employers about whether they should sponsor somebody like this is not. I think people there's there's a little bit of a, of a concept like oh, immigration is so easy. They just hire these foreign nationals. They take our jobs, uh, you know. No, nothing like that at all. But it, yeah, I mean, in, in the, sp the the sector that I work with and with employers and, and these, it is a big investment. And April 1st, the government just increased everything, you know, exponentially. The filing fees are higher than they've ever been. So it's not something they go into lightly. It's something they do because this is a talent this these are talented they educated help the get better and yeah and, profits, all that and kind of stuff. they're not finding that skill set um in other areas they're you know so, so does the company have to prove they can't find the skill set like how do they prove no, they can't find the skill not set? for an h1b for h1b's there's not there isn't that but for um employer sponsored green cards it's a higher burden okay. um so there's a process called the perm process and it goes through the Depar department of labor uscis um and then if they're here in the United States, that's you know how it's adjudicated. But in that Department of Labor process, there is a, a a piece of it that requires you to recruit. You have to engage in an active recruitment for the role to see if there are available, able, willing, and qualified U.S. workers. Okay. So, and, and this is for the green card process. This isn't for the H-1B process. But but even for the H-1B process, you have to post a notice. You have to post an attestation that says, "Hey, we're hiring." This is the role. This is the wage range. Here's the occupational category. And how long is that to stay up? Like how long? Has... Ten days. Okay. So, and it's it's part of the um, the initial steps, and then you file this labor condition application with the Department of Labor. You do these postings at the work site. So, we post ten days. Can it just be like post ten days on your on your company website where no one goes to, or do you have to actually like ten days on Indeed, Zip Recruiter? No, or... it's it's not telling the whole world. It's telling your workforce, and okay. so you can do two physical postings in conspicu conspicuous locations. Okay. So like most companies, if you're in person, have a like a wage and like a bulletin board, bulletin or board yeah, or okay. in the kitchen. OK, um, but you can also do an intranet. So you're you're letting your workforce know on site of this. Um, but for the perm and the green card process, you are required by the Department of Labor to go through that active recruitment. So it's a genuine bona fide, genuine good faith recruitment where you have to post um, at, in the state force state workforce agency. You have to post it in a paper of general circulation for two Sunday ads. So usually the Seattle Times and then three additional recruitment step, steps and then also on site a notice of filing. So um, you could do and the um, excuse me, the additional steps are are designated by the Department of Labor. So it's not like <clears throat> I can post anywhere. It's uh, there's a list of 
<clears throat> recruitment steps you can take. Yeah. So is like either for your law firm or like mm -hmm. any, uh, any of the nonprofit stuff, any committees, are there any events coming up that people should know about that she, they maybe she might want to attend? For the general public? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know of any like, general. Like any fundraising things coming up or just any events in general that people should know about, maybe go to? Um, uh, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on like okay. fundraising things. We we just went, you know, like I said, we just attended the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project Gala. But um, uh, we, you know, we're going to pretty soon put out another sort of informational webinar. My partner and I, Amy Royalty, are going to talk a little bit about like beyond the H-1B, what mm -hmm. that means for um, employers and foreign nationals who weren't selected in the lottery and are kind of like, we don't have another like limbo, option. Kind of limbo status. So to yeah, speak. like maybe there's not, there's a timeline they're up against where they're like, I have status and work authorization, but like, what are my next steps? How do I stay? How do I continue working? Um, and we're going to kind of try to continue to put out those sort of informational videos and things. Um, I mean, there's always opportunities to volunteer in the community. And so how does one reach out to you and volunteer? Like what? what are you, well, I, mean, are you, are you I, don't, I don't personally coordinate, but I would say looking at the nonprofits in and, our and community. And does a volunteer, does it mean, is that some type of volunteer you want or like? Uh, so, you know, like where we volunteer um, are like with the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project or with the One America, like they do these clin citizenship day clinics are always looking for people to come help support, um, you know, kind of you won't you won't be able to do the things that the attorneys yeah. or paralegals do. But even just being there to help coordinate day of is useful like logistics or operations. Yeah, or like there's that. there's always opportunities, um, even at the neighborhood clinics. When I was doing those more, more regularly, people had to facilitate and coordinate and man the front desk. And and so those are all volunteers. Here's one I just thought of. So I, I definitely think this is one of those conspiracy theories out there. I think one conspiracy theory is that the Biden administration is bringing all these illegal aliens on over here, second so term of voters, they'll vote them in the presidency again in the election. You can't vote unless you're a U.S. citizen. That's what I thought, yeah. Um, and so you can speed up the process or anything or? So you, in most yeah, cases, yeah, kill, you have yeah, to, kill this real fast. In most cases, yeah, you have to become a permanent resident first. And then depending on how the basis of that permanent residency. So if you're married to a U.S. citizen, you can uh, and you, you know, continue to be married and live with that U.S. citizen spouse. You have a three year path to permanent res to, to citizenship to apply for citizenship. It, in most cases, if you've received your permanent residence, your green card through employment, it's a five year track. Um, and so to be eligible to become a citizen, there's all sorts of other qualifications. It's not just biding your time. There's some physical and continuous presence in the United States. Um, you have to show that, you know, as a permanent resident, you're not, you can't just like leave and go live in your home country for five years and then come back and be like, hey, I want to be a, a citizen now. Um, you have to show that this is your, the U.S. is your vital center of interest. Um, good moral character is one. You have to show good moral character. So if you were a green card holder and you were, you know, had some criminal issues, those could prevent you from becoming a U.S. citizen. But um, once you're a U.S. citizen, you can vote. Uh, you have to register, but yeah, you can vote. Uh, there's not really a way to speed it up. There's some very limited, narrow categories um, that can slightly speed it up where if you are, you know, your spouse is a U.S. citizen and they're placed abroad, like military or, or certain provisions that allow it if they work for an employer that's engaged in like foreign um, trade and commerce, you can utilize some very niche provisions to to perhaps naturalize faster. But again, very small percentage of that um but yeah so you know there's it's pretty hard to so take ba it. basically if jason cabinet crosses the border today i'm not voting in the election in 2024 no okay. yeah you're very unlikely to well, why do you think that got out there like so crazy it's like so many people believe that it's all over, like people believe that i don't know if that has to do with people i think there may be more questioning the the um voting places Con you know maybe they're not confirming yeah or doing the right things. I, I don't know. It, it's pretty hard to, to fake insane. it. Yeah. Um, you, to become a U.S. citizen is an interesting process because, you know, I'd say even people born and gone through, who've gone through the educational system in the United States would might have a difficult time passing the civics exam to become a U.S. citizen. I, I don't think I could pass it right now, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I, I always, you know, when I talk to clients, they talk about how they will, because they're studying for this test yeah. that happens the day of their interview. And they will go to work and quiz their colleagues who were like born and raised in the U.S. and they're like, like they dude, can't pass. So like I got a D in civics. Like yeah. we didn't do this. It's like stuff, history, yeah. civics. It's you know you you get up to ten questions. It's all just you know you're sitting across from an immigration officer and they're just reading them out there's, to you. There's no Google in it. Nothing like no. That. You're, yeah, it's not I'll like a multiple choice written. No Chat TBT. What was this? Yeah. <laughs>
You have to have six out of 10, correct? And then you have to pass an English exam too. It's um, reading and writing, but I'd say that's maybe like first or second grade yeah. level. And, and there are some provisions that, mm. you know, can change that, but um, it's, it's not a simple process. Yeah. Again, I think there's a lot of ignorance or, or perhaps just hearing things that they believe from people who are people doing the research. Yeah. That make it seem so super easy to come in and get a job and oust U S workers and become yeah. a citizen and, and vote fraudulently. And it's, you know, there's a lot, a lot of, of tech. parameters in place and tests and requirements that you have to go through. And those who've gone through it can attest that it's a hard journey. Um, and if you're from one of those countries with that huge backlog, it might take you 20 years to get there. Right. And so it's um, um, it, it's the be like the one of the most satisfying things that I do is uh, being able to see somebody through that from start to finish. Like they'll come to me as a temporary worker and we'll get their green card. And then, you know, another few years pass and we go through the citizenship. And so we kind of get to see them through start to finish to end that immigration journey and become a U.S. citizen. And I think those are sort of like my most gratifying cases where you're like, wow, I just saw you like get married and have kids and, you know, like change jobs a bunch of times, start your own business, whatever. And you see this whole life, you know. What's happening. the oldest person you've seen become a U.S. citizen? Uh... Um, like general external number? I'd say, I think I've definitely done some citizen citizenship applications for people in their 70s. I don't know if I've done anybody 80 plus. Okay. I don't think so. Not that I recall. And so back to the H-1B visa, right? Those at the 85,000 slots, is that broken down by states or just 85,000 No, that's a, it's, it's, federal, it's a federal system. Okay. So everybody's going into the same pot. 65,000 are for a bachelor's degree or the equivalent. So if you could be like a, have a foreign mm -hmm. degree that's equivalent to a U.S. degree or have a combination of education and so work experience at a way. Not states, not broken up by industry. No. Okay. No, it's not industry specific, not okay. state specific. It's one pool. And then you have the 20,000 that are slated for people who mm -hmm. have come here and obtained U.S. master's degrees. Is there a separate program for people to say have like a doctor degree in something in Moscow or India or Germany, or is that a separate um, program? No, I mean, not as far as H-1B goes, there are different, so uh, there are different categories of visas when it comes to either non-immigrant or immigrant. So we call it like the alphabet soup when it comes to immigration. Like you'll he you'll hear these terms like TN, H-1B, L, F, M, like, so it is really this alphabet soup of visa categories. Um, and they apply differently depending on, you know, your eligibility. Um, some are specific to treaties that the United States has with other countries. There's like five countries that have, you know, so Canada and Mexico are part of the USMCA treaty. It's called NAFTA. Yeah, so yeah. individuals get the TN through that. It's only for specific professionals in a list that's in the appendix of that treaty. Um, Australians uh, can get an E3. It's a specific, again, to Australian citizens, and it's for specialty occupations. So in terms of the requirements, they are similar to an H-1B. It's a specialty occupation for degree professional, et cetera. But this is subset is for Australians. Um, then there is H1B1, and that's specific to Singaporean and Chilean citizens. And so, again, mimics the, the requirements of the H1B in many ways, but it's a, a separate quota for, and those quotas, the H1B1 and the E3, those don't ever get exhausted so that we don't see this lottery system that um, the H, because then it's like, then you've got the H1B for like everybody else, right? And yeah. so, in that way, yeah, there's, it, it can be, um, you know, we don't have those other options for Indian citizens or Chinese citizens or, you know, how, whoever else, um, you know, usually the pool of applicants is, is from across the world. Yeah. Would you say coming from a certain country gives you advantage or disadvantage in the system? Like you, you might be like, if, I'm, I'm presuming you're from Canada, you're trying to move Canada versus like, oh no, Rwanda from East Africa and Canadian might have an advantage or so plus all like fair across the board, regardless where you come from. I think you, you have different options. Like if you're Canadian and you don't get your H-1B, you might qualify for a TN. And that doesn't exist for somebody from Rwanda. There isn't a treaty with that country in the United States giving this. And that doesn't mean that every Canadian can say, okay, I'll just get a TN because you have to be in a profession that's listed in that treaty. And it's limited. It's, you know, you, there's really nothing for like business or sales or any of those marketing. Those positions don't exist. So if you're Canadian and that's your field, then you're probably not going to get a TN. But, um, you know, in terms of the wait time we talked about when it comes to like the green card path, because of the demand 
if you're Canadian versus an Indian citizen or Chinese citizen, where there are those larger backlogs and that longer wait time, yeah, there's there is an advantage. Your your path to, towards permanent residency will be faster because because there isn't that that large queue of individuals waiting ahead of you. I mean, there still is a queue, but it's going to be substantially um, smaller. Yeah, I know. Like a lot of people, like immigration, they're like, you know, limited immigration. My thing has always been like, as a country, we ever get the place where people don't want to come here. That's where we should be rewarded, right? And we might be getting there. I mean, I think that we're seeing a lot of people, and I've had clients who are here, we're on work visas, say, I'm done, I'm done waiting, I'm done not having any security, and I have opportunities in other countries, and I'm going to go because, again, it's, I mean, we can't imagine living in a country where every day you're like, this could all be just pulled, the rug could be pulled out yeah. from under me. I could get laid off and then I have to go back and I've been here for a decade or whatever it might be. And so that it's exhausting to somebody, you know, mentally, yeah, mentally yeah, be, yeah. emotionally, like how do you plan a life? Like even after a while you're like, I have a family, I want to buy a home, I want to do all these things, but like, is this all temporary or can I be here for the long term? So earlier when we first started talking, you talked about something that President Obama started, I think it's called the DECA of Dreamers. Is that yeah. still around? Because I know it was a um, controversy a few years ago. About yeah, that. so initial initial DOC applications are no longer being accepted or allowed at this time. But if you have DACA, you can renew and you can renew your work permit. But one of the big challenges, and this is, I mean, I think this is a, a big thing in Congress right now too, is um, the delays that we're seeing. So for dreamers that are- and This is like a kid who was born here to illegal parents? Or no, what if, you're, what if you're is born that? in the United States, you are U.S. citizen. Okay. Even if your parents were undocumented, you're, okay. yeah, the, okay. we haven't gotten rid of that. I think in some of our prior administrations, there's been discussions about like, well, maybe we should change what it means to, you know, but no, but being born in the United States with some minor exceptions for like people who are here as diplomats and things like that and have kids here, um, you are a U.S. citizen, but there is a subset of individuals um, who came across, who were, who were brought across by their parents um, and they were children. They were, you know, young children. And um, a lot of people didn't even, some people grew up and didn't even know that they were undocumented. Like they just, their memories yeah, in their I lives. I've heard a lot of stories of that, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm trying to remember when this was, I think this was in 2000 and I wasn't, I remember I was in law school, I think, or maybe I was just out of law school uh, when when the executive order came out. But um, it's a it's a very specific time frame. I don't know off the top of my head, like you have to have been physically present in the United States during a, a set, time period um and then there's some other provisions about like character like you can have certain criminal yeah. issues um but you can apply for uh, and you also have to show a certain education of like you graduated from high school and things like that but you you can get a work permit and work on the u.s and um the the and basically like it's a deferred action like they're not going to take any action against you um but right now like i recently had individuals who we're applying for like their work permit renewal and you know it's taking like 120 days to get the the work permit again some categories of work permits the government has allowed for an auto extension so like if you timely file for your work permit to be renewed before it expires then you your work permit is extended for like 180 days or that recently the government has extended to 540 days um daca is not one of those categories okay. so if you have a, a work permit and you're it's expiring and you don't have another option, which most individuals don't, then you have to stop working or get termi you know, get terminated from your employment. Um, and that there's this gap, there's this inconsistency. It's like, well, you know, why wasn't it given to this? Why, well, one, why isn't it moving faster? But two, if not, why can't we make sure that this category gets that auto extension? Because it's not their fault that yeah, it's taking it's like, a long yeah, time. It makes, doesn't seem American, so to speak, right? Yeah. So um, it's, I mean, it's it's great. There can be more that was that could be done for those individuals, but you know that was sort of like one example of how an administration can effectuate change, right? Like, can put in something that can help a, a big segment of individuals in in any way, in some small way, even. So, your clients or individuals is that do you, do you keep it strict like like the, um, the immigration stuff, or do you like help them find jobs, help them find support services if they need it, or is it um, totally different? We don't help them find jobs. It's not okay. really like a, a part of our process. We're, you know, we're, we're their lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, we help them understand options, perhaps, okay. um, and say like, okay, well, here's, 
here's what's available to you. And like, of course, it's their job to find a, a position in an employer and then that employer to sponsor them. Um, as far as support services, I think a lot of attorney, immigration attorneys do. Yeah, they provide like, you know, here's some resources for counseling services or, you know, other things that might might be needed. And probably the clients I work with, that's less common. Um, but I certainly connect them as needed with other professionals if they need help. Like, oh, I, I need a tax advisor for international taxes or I need an employment lawyer, et cetera. So, Marcia, is there anything else that I asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Um, I don't know. I feel like we covered a lot today. Um, it could be anything. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I think we talked about my firm and sort of what we do, uh, the kind of, the the types of clients we work with. It's really a large spectrum of types of corporate clients and families and the pro bono work we do. I think we did a pretty good job, yeah. Cool. Um, so, is, before we get out, can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? You need some immigration advice. <laughs> is there anything that you want to ask me today? No, not right now. But I'm definitely gonna get with you later. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think. Um, yeah. My my general kind of goal is to kind of keep doing what I'm doing, help support businesses and families, um, and provide that sort of insight and guidance into the immigration system that I think is. I mean, if if that's not what you do, it's hard to know and um, it's hard to navigate. It's a it's a maze of a system. And sometimes even we have a tough time navigating it. Sometimes even we hit those roadblocks and we're like, hey, best I can tell you to do is call, talk to your congressperson, talk to an ombudsman at the agency. But it's a wait. I mean, so much of it is a waiting game uh, also. And I think that can be the most frustrating part for clients is like they're just so sick of waiting for the bureaucracy. And I mean, there's things that should be done and can be done probably to fix that, but it's also just the volume of immigration cases that's going through the system. And certainly COVID didn't help with that, right? I mean, that changed the world and in, in many ways and certainly impacted our immigration system during that time when offices were closed, consulates were closed. And I think we're maybe just getting out of that now and starting to see um, that those backlogs getting you know trimmed down a bit more. Uh, there are other ways that the government's trying to be more efficient. They've just started. This was the first year they ever did a stateside visa for a very select few individuals um, where they because normally to get a visa to travel, you have to leave the country, go to a consulate and apply. They did a, a program, a pilot program this year. And this existed many years ago before I before I began practicing. But my cult and my colleagues that have practiced a lot longer than I have remember when you could get a visa locally. Um, and they just implemented that, a, a pilot program at the beginning of this year for like a finite amount to see if we can start doing that again. Um, so I think there's there's things that are happening, things that are changing. And to start, our job to sort of keep abreast of it, let clients know, help them figure out what applies, what doesn't, where to use caution, where to prepare ahead of time, um, and then what to do if like you're, you are you get targeted, you, you get an audit, you know, the government's looking at you. Um, and... Does the government ever ask like immigration law firms like input on policy? Um, yeah, I mean, to some degree, like we definitely get, our, so through our, I don't think they come to like a firm, but like through our immigration lawyers association, through the bar association, we'll get reached, you know, we'll have a government um, like the CIS will have a ombudsman or a liaison reach out and say, we want to talk to stakeholders in this area, it's not just to lawyers, but stakeholders in general and say, you know, where where do you need more support? Where can we do better? You know, how can we shift things? I think they depend on that information, too, to understand what's working and not working. Yeah. And that's not always the case, like we talked about with different administrations. We've seen varying levels of that communication. When the last administration was in place, those doors were pretty tightly shut and there was not a lot of communication or transparency given to us. And then as administrations shift, we start to see it's it's an all of our benefit to do that for the government and for stakeholders to be open and communicate and everybody benefits from that. And so it's, it's the term is, is it called immigration judge? Uh, yeah. And, um, yeah an and so, or so or some immigration judges like known as like being like pro-immigrant, anti-immigrant. And are you able to like kind of like, you know, steer your client to the pro-immigrant judges versus... No, uh, I mean, so I don't practice in 
court, so I'm not the best person to ask that the, those questions to. But no, you you generally can't select you get, whatever who, judge you get. Yeah, you, you have to deal with. Okay. Select who court or it's All right. Signed, yeah. All right. Hey, Martha, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate you. Thank you. It was fun. I was a little nervous. I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I'm cool enough to be on a podcast, but I'll give it a shot. Yeah, you're very cool. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.